Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Green, and I'm the Associate Dean for Teaching, Learning, and Undergraduate Education, NOPE Experiential Education, in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities. Um, and I am delighted to be here today to welcome everyone, both in the room and uh, remote, to our ninth annual CSSH Undergraduate Research Forum. The um, the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities will be here in a moment to welcome you officially, but I thought I would take um, this time just to do a little bit of housekeeping, uh, particularly for our presenters and our moderators. So we are being live streamed and we do have sign language interpreters with us today. Um, I'm just doing some housekeeping, Uta, and then I will introduce you. So what that means between the people watching us on live stream and our interpreters is that we are lucky to have plenty of time on the program. When you are presenting, you do not need to rush your speaking. Um, if you speak in a kind of normal cadence, that will be helpful both for our interpreters and for the people who are listening to us um, remotely. So that's the first housekeeping note is you don't need to rush. Um, the second housekeeping note is that we do have a remote here for the slides. We have all of your slides um, on a computer that Jen Grieve, the executive assistant, sitting behind Shannon there, uh, is going to be running. You can either use the remote to advance your slides yourself, or Jen is happy to do it for you if you want to use the universal next slide code um, when you're presenting. So it's up to you. Um, we will have presenters for any individual panel sitting in one of these first two rows. Um, when it is your, we'll present in the order on the program, and when it is your turn to present, you can just come up to the podium. Um, it is mic'd, and so, you know, speak in the general direction of the microphone, but you don't need to do anything peculiar um, with your, with your, um, with your orientation. Um, Jared, is there anything else I need to mention? No, Jared is giving me the note. Okay. Um, in that, oh, uh, one more thing for each panel, we will hold questions until the end of the panel. Um, when the panel is over, I will ask panelists and the moderator um, all to come up and kind of flank the screen there, and we will be able to um, have questions from the audience. Jen is also very kindly monitoring the live feed chat. So if you are listening to this and you are remote, when the question period comes, please do feel free to put a question into the chat and Jen will be able to share those for us. Um, there are also refreshments off to my right. Um, so please feel free to help yourselves to those at any point. And now, I think having set the stage effectively, it is my great pleasure to introduce the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, Dean Uta Poiger. Thank you, Dean Green. As um, Dean Green said, I am Uta Poiger, the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, and it's also my great pleasure to welcome all of you to Questing and Belonging to our ninth annual CSSH Undergraduate Research Forum. This is really always a proud occasion for all of us in the college, and it's a pleasure to welcome those of you who are here in person today, and I know that people will be coming in and out in the course of the afternoon, as well as all of those of you who are witnessing and participating online today. Undergraduate research, and in general research, as you know, is key to the experiential liberal arts mission of the college. And this is really always a wonderful occasion to understand better how all of you as undergraduate students are participating either individually in research processes or also are collaborating with one another, with our faculty, with graduate students sometimes on collaborative research. What we also see is that a lot of that research often involves partner organizations beyond the university. And again, I think we will see 
examples of all of such approaches in the course of this afternoon. I'm also once again very impressed as I'm looking at questing and belonging, what the broad range of questions is that you are all asking. Questions that are so important um, to this current world, world, questions about climate justice, questions about information justice, um, questions also about history, um, about democracy. And again, one can get already a whiff of this just from looking at the topics and the subtitles. You are really taking a broad range of approaches to answering big questions of our time and also to reminding us of things um, that have great significance from the past from which we can learn. So again, very, very exciting to see work that crosses from the humanities to the social sciences to policy and well beyond the college as well. And it's really, really nice also that some of you are students of CSSH and some of you are not students of CSSH and that all of you are participating in the exchanges of this afternoon. I have to apologize that I won't be able to stay for very long today. I'm glad that we'll also have the record um, of this um, because of the online modality that we are engaging in as well. But I want to wish all of you a very successful conversation. I would want to add to what Dean Green said already. During the Q&A period, it would be really nice as you ask questions if you quickly identify yourself as well because it's always really nice to understand who's in the audience and who is asking questions as well. Again, many thanks to Dean Green and everybody in the college for organizing this wonderful afternoon and many thanks to all of you presenters and the audience and I wish you a very constructive set of interactions this afternoon. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to turn over to Katja Boczkower who is the moderator of our first panel. Hello everyone and welcome to our first panel. We will have four presentations today. Um, each presenter will get about 12 minutes and oh, that's right. uh, and <laughs> I was just beginning to doubt myself um, and uh, we will uh, uh, get all the questions at the end. So our first presenter is Angelina Megan. Um, she is a criminal justice and psychology major. Hi everyone, um, I'm very happy to be here today. Today I'll be talking about the association between domestic violence and war trauma in Ukraine. This is a research project that Dr. Boshkovar invited me into in about 2021 and we've been working on the project for a while so I'm really excited to be here. So first, domestic violence is a very important crime problem to study because it has a pattern of repeat offenses and a tendency to escalate with each offense. I can't overstate the actual harm that occurs of domestic violence as a crime problem. It, occur, it results in severe psychological and physical harm to the victims of domestic violence. Individuals can experience this harm on short term or long term, um, and eventually it has a tendency to increase and it can increase towards mortality. So on an individual level, the crime problem is extremely important and relevant to really understand. However, it can also exist in different modes. Domestic violence can affect the families. So individuals and families that experience domestic violence, it can lead to child and elder abuse. Outside of that, individuals who are victims of domestic violence, it affects the social bonds that they create in their community. It can affect alcohol use. It can affect economic strain. So it really does have a community effect. And when we zoom out on a large scale, this leads to mass public health effects of domestic violence. So overall, our goal in researching domestic violence is to identify both risk factors that increase domestic violence or protective factors that help minimize it. And ideally, we would be able to create some change on the policy or public health sector, the community sector that then can go down into the individuals and really help victims. So part of the research that we did was ex an extensive literature review to really see what factors do we know to be associated with domestic violence. Two of these factors that we saw again and again in literature and that ended up being relevant in our research were stress and alcohol use. 
So stress can occur over a long period of time or there could be a stressful event. So it is complex to measure. Again, with alcohol use, a lot of times it's habitual. And so it can also, when we're looking at both of these patterns, it's sometimes hard to identify to what extent does stress or alcohol use affect my behavior when I felt stressed in the future and looking at it in the present. However, these patterns really were associated. We found stress to be associated with intimate partner perpetration. So individuals who were more stressed were then more likely to be offenders of domestic violence. Moreover, stress increased the odds of experiencing domestic violence as a victim. So individuals who were more stressed were more likely to self-report um, and experiencing domestic violence. A theory that might explain how these two um, factors are associated as dialectic stress. This theory argues that stress experienced by one part, a stressful event experienced by one partner in a relationship can echo down into the second partner's life. So if one partner experiences, let's say, career stress, they will come home and they'll have um, be more impulsive and their partner will pick up on it and they could be a little anxious and trigger this first partner which will result in an experience of domestic violence. So this is just one theory to argue why perpetration and victimization is related to stress. On top of it, alcohol use. So individuals who consumed alcohol were more likely to perpetrate domestic violence as offenders. As well, individuals who consumed alcohol were more likely to self-report domestic violence victimization. Um, again, it's unclear right now if the stress and alcohol use occurs before the fact of domestic violence and after the fact, which is part of the reason why more research in this area really is needed. But within the context of war. And so this is really interesting. There's a lot of opportunity looking at the intersection of domestic violence and war. Um, but we've seen two large trends, one in the individual level and the other in the community and public health. So on the individual level, domestic violence increases in areas of armed conflict. However, also individuals who were displaced from conflict, we also see um, domestic violence increase in er for displaced women. However, We've seen war trauma to be transmitted from the individual level to the family level. Um, war at Home by Katani described this phenomenon in which um, husbands went to war and the wives whose husbands went to war were more likely to engage in physical or emotional abuse towards their children. From here we do see a pattern of domestic violence um, resulting from uh, indirect war exposure. And so there is a standard of war exposure from direct to indirect that we see. Again, this goes into community and public health, collective trauma. Collective trauma is associated with gender-based violence. So our area of study, we looked at the Donbas war in Ukraine. There's a lot of availability in the research or opportunity because post-Soviet countries, especially in Eastern Europe, are largely, um, there's just a lot of opportunity to look more at them. Specific to Ukraine, the first law which outlawed domestic violence was passed in 2017. This means that there's a lot of opportunity. There's a real necessity for us to measure how does domestic violence look in this, for us to measure the success of policies, especially given the armed conflict that has been in Ukraine. So our area of study was the Donbas War, which was between 2014 and 2022, but we know now that conflict has increased to a significant extent in Ukraine, so it is very imperative that we begin to take research now, we look at domestic violence as a risk factor, and we start to understand what does it look like in this area. So what happened? There, we sent out Northeastern and um, University of Miami faculty to Ukraine who administered a questionnaire. This questionnaire taught, looked at demographic data to see who we were looking at. And um, we looked at two cities, Lviv and Kharkiv. One city was pretty rural, but was the, orig like the origin area from which a lot of people who fought in the war came from. The second city was pretty close to the conflict itself. So we can assume that there was transportation between both cities and the conflict, but also that our subjects had varying exposure to war, and um, both directly and indirectly. After that, we looked at various factors, including stress and alcohol use, that we believe to be associated with domestic violence, 
um, both from our literature review and our understanding of domestic violence. Other factors can include daily hassles, aggression, um, depression, etc. From our re and then we looked at self-reported victimization and perpetration of domestic violence, asking individuals, have I experienced this violence? Have I given it to someone else and it behaved in that way? We found two trends. In total, across both genders, daily hassles and uh, um, daily hassles and a negative emotion were associated with domestic violence. This means individuals who were going about their day and had difficulties, whether that could be economic stresses, um, trouble getting from one place to another, individuals who were just more stressed out day to day were more likely to then engage in domestic violence as an offender. On top of it, negative affect. So the idea of negative feelings like depression, anger, frustration, individuals who self-reported these feelings were then more likely to behave violently towards their partners. However, we saw one difference by gender. So men were more likely to offend in domestic violence if they consumed alcohol and or if they were exposed to war. From these patterns, we really do see that there are clear associations with domestic violence and that there are possible or that there are things that we can work on to help alleviate factors that increase the risk of domestic violence. However, I think a big takeaway from this research is that there is a real need for more research on domestic violence specific to this area of interest. Um, it is really, really easy to or clear to assume that in the time since our study, conflict has increased in Ukraine, and we can assume that more people have been exposed to war trauma and conflict. Therefore, it is likely that we see um, stronger factors and associations of domestic violence today, so real research is needed to go in and to look at the associations and to help protect victims. Again, though, what can we do with the research we have now? We have clear... Um, identifiers and factors, and this can help um, show policy where to give support. Should we um, help individuals with coping mechanisms so they don't engage in night or experience as much negative affect, it's like, etc. Overall, I'm really, really grateful to be part of this research. Thank you for listening to it. Um, it's been amazing to be part of it, and I'm really happy to be here. So thank you. <laughs>
In order to analyze these implications, I studied the issue on two levels, international and individual, for I wanted to truly understand how not only the individual victims were affected by this phenomenon, but also how these views could be projected onto the international system as a whole. In order to target the international level, I analyzed the United Nations and other international organizations' responses to more modern genocides and war crimes in the context of genocide denial, lack of intervention, and of course, specific dialogue. More specifically, I looked at how these organizations justified their responses, or lack thereof, to mass atrocities and genocides, not solely the actions themselves. Allowing conclusions to be made about genocide denial in the context of the Holocaust and the overall policies of these organizations. For the individual level, I combined my studies by not only analyzing extensive literature on the direct implications of genocide denial, but also utilizing my personal experience in the Balkans and using the genocide of Srebrenica as not only a sense of context, but to also provide tangible and first-hand examples. I have also spoken to people who are descendants of genocide to bring their first-hand experiences and emphasize how generations of people are affected. Whether it be conversations with locals, families of victims, or government officials, I felt it was important to bring the people of a lost genocide in order to truly see how they were affected. The most influential pieces of literature throughout me research were Ada Alarian in her book Consequences of Denial, which was a case study of the Armenian genocide, a study by Behrens, Terry, and Jensen, which formed the theory of alt-right po political affiliation groups using genocide denial to their benefit, and Gabrian, who discussed the maritime genocide denial in the context of the 2006 French ban on genocide denial. With this, I was able to connect the responses of the international system to the physical victims and how their personal lives are shaped in the aftermath of their actions, while in conjunction looking at state and national consequences from individual backlash. Very early on in my research process, I came to the important conclusion that placing the Holocaust as a genocide standard has created a specific justification for genocide denial, a denial that has shifted from organizations and individuals from saying, I don't think this happened, to I know something happened, but it's not bad enough to do anything about it. This was all caused by the idea that since nothing could amount to what happened during the Holocaust, smaller genocides are deemed to be not that important, which soon became the main pinpoint of my research. When considering the international level, one of the main points I found that was after the United Nations coined the term for genocide, they were under the impression that nothing like the Holocaust would ever happen again. And even if it did, it could never be as drastic or as deadly. In some ways, this reigns true. The, after the Holocaust, there is yet to be another genocide of the same size and scope. However, the United Nations was wrong in the fact that there would never be another genocide. This blissful ignorance has not only allowed for hundreds of mass atrocities to take place with their knowledge, but to also pass by without any meaningful action. Um, but I'll, one of the best examples is what occurred in Srebrenica. During the Bosnian War, Srebrenica was declared a safe and neutral zone by the United Nations, meaning there was United Nations soldiers present the entire time the invasion and genocide took place. Not only were the calls for intervention by citizens ignored, but also the information provided to the United Nations by soldiers working for the organization itself. Another prominent example is what occurred in the Rwandan genocide. While the United Nations were, there was, were aware there was a war in mass killings, they believed that an African country would not have the technological capacity to complete mass genocide. They only intervened after it was far too late and did not provide substantial reparations to the affected communities. These are just two examples of the United Nations turning a blind eye in the face of genocide and war crimes. When the international organizations compare mass atrocities and declare certain conflicts not drastic enough for their intervention, I have found that it creates a sense of dehumanization for the victims of genocide and a normalization of the act itself. At the end of the day, people are being killed regardless of how big or small a conflict is. By creating a threshold of genocide and making it seem that more genocide, some genocides are more important than others, it creates the notion that war crimes and mass atrocities are just a part of everyday life and creates the precedent that the loss of lives through genocide is justifiable if it isn't on a larger scale giving the international system the impression that genocide is an achievable war tactic, for it often goes without urgency or consequence. On the, on the individual level, this targeted genocide denial goes far beyond the loss of lives. When considering the lack of intervention by international organizations, victims of genocide are being told that what happened to them wasn't deemed important enough for action to take place. With this, they will rarely receive care or reparations. Not only does this create generational trauma, but I have found this also creates a lack of trust in national and international organizations. At the end of the day, international organizations are supposed to provide a sense of unbiased international law. However, when they normalize genocide and fail to take action, these victims do not view them as valid. Without trust in international organizations, what is left? 
This idea can be very prominently seen in modern day Sarajevo, which is the capital of Bosnia, which is covered in anti-government and anti-United Nations posters and graffiti. The one that stuck out to me the most while I was there was a big mural that was standing directly behind a Srebrenica memorial that states, Europe, it wasn't enough, was it? This idea also stems to a phenomenon that when people or governments see genocide being committed with no meaningful consequences, what is to stop them from doing the same and justifying the action? This not only causes individuals to buy into extremist ideologies, but this dialect has become policy points for nation's conservative agendas. This idea can very prominently be seen when considering the Armenian genocide. Even on the 100 year anniversary, the Turkish government failed to even acknowledge what had occurred, and they pushed other countries to do the same. Although the United Nations had not been formed at the time of the genocide, they had yet to step in and reprimand Turkey for their actions, leading to not only a lack of closure and reparations for the victims, but also extremely high tensions in the region. This lack of intervention by the United Nations, regardless of when the genocide took place, has only allowed for Turkey to utilize these lack of consequences to usher in policy rooted in racism, racism and discrimination while Armenians are still suffering. Finally, a very important individual complex con consequence I found that was the idea when in this vein of genocide denial there truly is no end for victims. With victims receiving virtually no reparations from international organizations and their countries, combined with a lack of consequences for the other side, Tensions will forever be high and countries will remain unstable. A clear example of this I saw in Bosnia on the 27th anniversary of the genocide. One of my professors published a tweet acknowledging the anniversary and the victims, but this tweet was immediately met with immediate backlash and threats, regardless of the fact that my professor did not even use the word genocide. He was still attacked for even insinuating it. Furthermore, as seen in post-war Bosnia, there has yet to be govern governmental negotiations between the ethnic groups even 20 years later. This has ushered in high tensions and instability that has drained the government of its resources. Even here in Boston, I have an Armenian friend who feels deep animosity towards Turkish students at their school. She says there is undeniable tension between these two groups, even generations later and not even in the region. This type of genocide denial not only gives power to the abusers, but also ushers in a lifetime with a lack of closure for victims. It is no question that genocide and genocide denial is inhumane and incorrect. But unfortunately, it has moved from saying certain genocides never happen to making excuses for why this denial is valid. These ideas stem from the idea that the United Nations fails to take action in not only recent genocides, but is also contributing to this dangerous rhetoric. Now, more than ever, genocide is being normalized because of an inflated sense of what truly affects the world. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, we live in a society that treats genocide, war, and mass atrocities as everyday parts of life. Driven by profit and cost efficiency, international organizations fail to meet the demands of minority groups that they do not deem important enough. Creating a precedent that max ranks mass atrocities and turns people into statistics, this rhetoric humanizes the idea of mass killings and war, creates generational trauma, a lack of trust in governments, and of course the unfortunate idea that genocide is a feasible war tactic. In no way am I suggesting that the United Nations must inve investigate every little thing, but if there is clear evidence of war crimes and genocide taking place, it is the job of international organizations to promote diplomacy and provide unbiased international law. Regardless of how big or small an issue is, genocide is a threat to international security. Using the largest mass atrocity in recent human history as a threshold for intervention will not stop genocide, but instead show extremist groups how much they can truly get away with. The most difficult aspect of this research that I must enforce is the sheer idea that it does not have to be this way. Of course, international organizations are always going to be driven by profit and they're always going to be controlled by countries with power, but as citizens, we still have the power to how we respond and how we prevent. Now more than ever, it's important to educate ourselves on issues and consciously stop ourselves from thinking smaller problems are no big deal. Look around. Congressmen blatantly stating they wish to eradicate transgender people, women being threatened with capital punishment for wanting to have an abortion, and gun violence against people of color in the LGBTQ community. Regardless of how big or small targeted groups are, I urge you to think about what truly sets our country apart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shannon. And our uh, third presenter is Caitlin Lee from Sociology. Hi, 
everyone, I'm Ari, and I'll be presenting my research from my capstone project this semester for sociology. So my project is challenging the myth, Asian American athletes' as sense of belonging in elite sports. Um, I think that this is an important topic to research because there is a lack of research on the Asian American experience, particularly in sports. Um, there's also been a rise of Asian American athletes in elite sports, especially in the Olympics. Um, and with the last three Olympics being in Asia, there's actually been a lot of investigative journalism on those Asian American athletes' experiences abroad and then coming home to experiences of racism. So I think that this is an interesting and important topic to examine in this moment. Um. Okay, um, so my research question is, how do Asian American athletes' identities and their relationships to their identities impact their feelings of belonging in NCAA, Division I, or elite level sports? Um, I chose this topic because I am a former elite athlete myself, and I'm also an Asian American woman. Um, and when I was doing my research, or my literature review on the topic, um, it became clear that the model minority myth is a large tenet um, and a manifestation of institutional racism for Asian Americans. And so I kind of wanted to explore the function of the model minority myth in the experiences of sports for Asian Americans. Um, again, with my literature review, I found that stereotypes against Asian Americans that come from the model minority myth are particularly salient. So things like Asian Americans being quiet or submissive, not powerful, um, lacking leadership qualities, things like that. And that those stereotypes conflict often with the image that we have of athletes being powerful, aggressive, um, having those leadership qualities. And so I wondered if the model minority myth tells us that we cannot or should not be athletes, what happens to our sense of self when we are athletes? Um, I also think it's important for me to take the moment to acknowledge my positionality in this research. Obviously, I was a former athlete myself. I am an Asian American woman and that those two identities I hold very dear to my heart. Um, and so I want to acknowledge that I do hold those positionalities and I will be engaging in an iterative process throughout my research, throughout my data collection and my analysis with my peers, my advisors, my professors, in order to ensure that my biases and my experiences aren't coloring the ways that I analyze or explore my participants' experiences. Okay. In terms of methodology, I used a qualitative method. So I did semi-structured interviews, um, and after my lit review, I formulated questions to learn more about um, the athletes' Uh, identities, how they name their identities, their relationships to their identities, um, their family lives, the cultural context in which they grew up, um, their relationships to their culture of origin. I also looked at their journeys through sports, the kinds of sports that they played, their feelings of belonging, um, particularly in their feelings of support and value in their sports, as well as their uh, relationships to their teammates and their coaches. Um, I learned with every interview that I did. Uh, so after every interview, I did some reflection, learned how to better ask follow-up questions, learned what questions needed more context, um, learned how to better answer follow-up questions from my participants. So I think it's important to, to name that I learned with every, every iteration of the interview. Um, I have 11, 11 participants so far. I have a couple more coming up, so I'm very excited about that. Um, but you can just see some metrics there about the participants that I have interviewed so far. Um, I also want to acknowledge that all of my participants are college are or were college athletes or college students that attended four-year universities, um, and that all of their parents had bachelor's degrees and a handful had advanced degrees. So I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, class status of my participants as well. Um, I also want to note that this is an in-progress project. Um, so I haven't done any systematic analysis, but the findings that I'll present here are preliminary from the first 11 interviews that I've conducted. Um, after I'm done with all my interviews, I'll be using Invivo, which is a qualitative um, analysis software to engage in that more systematic approach. Okay. So here are my preliminary findings. Um, the first thing that I want to note is that race does seem to be a salient aspect of these athletes' experiences in sports. Um, the model minority myth often um, minimizes experiences of racism for Asian Americans because there is that assumption that they are high achieving, high class, things like that. And so I think it's important to note that race does seem to be a salient aspect, whether positive or negative. So one example of that is that Asian, Asian American athletes do seem to find community and um, belonging in their relationships with their fellow teammates, Asian teammates. So this participant here says, I felt like 
um, it kind of gave me like a sense of community within the team, which I was very thankful for. Um, another athlete says, there's always that thing where Asians tend to gravitate towards talking about, oh, what kind of Asian are you? Oh, you also played piano for a long time. So those kind of cultural connections really bring Asian athletes together and kind of form a sense of community for them. Um, I also want to share a couple of stories. Um, one uh, South Asian volleyball player actually told a story about how she tore her ACL in middle school. It was a very hard injury for her to go through. She was out of the sport for a year. But one of the questions that she asked her parents was, is it because of my anatomy? Is it because I'm Indian? That this Was that a factor in my injury? She says that there wasn't a lot of South Asian representation in elite sports, so she thought that that might have been a factor in the reason why she got her injury. Um, another athlete, a Chinese diver, uh, she's an adoptee from China into an Asian American family. But she noted that growing up, obviously a lot of divers in the Olympics and the world championships are Chinese. And she said, I kind of put an invisible pressure on myself because I saw so many Chinese divers achieving that I felt like I needed to be like them. Um, another athlete, a swimmer um, in a D1 program, noted that um, when they had an impressive CAA conference result, that their athletics program actually posted a different Asian teammate on social media. And so that was obviously another, another experience in which race was salient. And so I think those um, four examples are very um, indicative and kind of illustrate the fact that race is a salient aspect of these experiences. Um, these next two points I kind of want to um, tie together in that they, the model minority myth is somewhat um, reinforced by the institutional racism that these athletes have to um, face in the sports that they're, that they're doing and the ways that they participate in elite sports. So the first one is this marginal sports point. So a lot of times in sports, race is talked about in a very black and white binary. So Asian Americans don't really have a space or a place in the conversation when it comes to race and sports. And so I think that the fact that a lot of these athletes are participating in sports like fencing, figure skating, swimming, pistol shooting, that aren't really those like headlining sports at universities or in other, you know, in like popular imagination of sports like football or basketball, um, that it kind of is indicative of this invisibility of Asian Americans, especially in the sports space. Um, so a kind of example of that, I think, is this athlete saying, for example, sports that are huge has that outer community that kind of like subconsciously supports them. But I feel like fencing sometimes goes unnoticed. So I think that's, again, illustrating kind of the invisibility of Asian Americans within sport. Um, another aspect that I think kind of reinforces the model minority myth is this focus on academic performance and career trajectories. Um, another aspect of the model minority myth tells us that Asian Americans are intellectuals, that they work hard and they're, you know, they're um, career oriented and things like that. And so I thought it was interesting how and why a lot of these athletes participated in sports. So um, a lot of, a handful of the athletes actually mentioned that they joined sports as a kind of resume booster or something unique to put on their college applications. Um, this one athlete says, I started fencing because my older brother wanted something unique to put on his resume. When we started fencing, I was there and I was like, let me sign up. So obviously these motivations to enter sports seems to be uh, a unique aspect that reinforces the model minority myth. Another one here, it says, um, also, I guess I really liked the institution as a school and like academically, I saw that it fit. So it seems that these athletes, when choosing college programs, not only focus on the, the athletic opportunities that come about, but also the academic fit of the program and the school. Um, another athlete says, so those are like the main reasons why I continued playing and still play to this day. I've learned so much about confidence, poise, leadership, communication, all those very integral interpersonal skills that I can transfer into my professional settings, academic settings settings basically anywhere. So again, the motivation for this athlete to continue in sports is because of those interpersonal skills that she can then transfer into an academic or professional setting. Um, so again, I thought that was interesting and in a way works to reinforce some of what the model minority myth tells us about Asian Americans. Um, lastly, I think that despite all of these things and the ways that they participate reinforcing the myth. I think that on an individual level, many of the athletes are challenging the myth in, in their own ways. Um, so again, like I said, you know, physical strength, leadership, um, you know, just representation in sports is like very um, lacking from Asian Americans. And so I think in a lot of ways, these athletes are, again, challenging the myth on an individual level. So the same South Asian volleyball player says, 
and just to be more proud of myself, you know, there's not a lot of like South Asian people who do this. And I think it's important to show younger South Asian student athletes that this is something they can do if they want to and that they shouldn't be pressured away from it because of cultural norms, peer pressure, whatever else. Um, another athlete, a rower, um, on his physical performance says, on my team right now, everyone knows that I'm like a more than capable person. Even though my position on the team is a coxswain, so generally the smaller people, compared to the rowers, I definitely lift with the rowers and put up more weight than some of them. So they all know I'm very capable at handling my own. Again, again, a, an example of them kind of challenging the myth that they are just physically just as capable as their non-Asian teammates. Um, another quote on leadership. Once someone says, trying to take that leadership role, our meditation teacher was like, I'm proud of the stuff you made, and that made me proud, that I could take that leadership into a different boat class. I felt like I brought that leadership of the boat culture and the boat I wanted to take. So again, um, Asian Americans are often not seen as leaders, but this athlete showing that in this athletic space, he can demonstrate those leadership qualities that the model minority myth often tells him that he, he can't have, that he doesn't have. Um, so again, very preliminary findings, but I think that there's some interesting patterns here that I'm excited to continue exploring as I continue my project. So thank you for the time. <laughs>
many colleges and universities have pretty comprehensive plans to reduce emissions themselves um, or become carbon neutral. Um, they tend to be climate isolationists as well, which is a which is essentially the idea of <coughs> climate the climate crisis being its own issue, something that's like you can point to this issue um, and like solve that issue without really addressing um, socioeconomic inequities that it caused that it's caused by and causes. Um, so a lot of universities are taking this isolationist approach where they're researching climate change but not really funding the um, parallel socioeconomic research or changes within their institutions. Um, but we in this paper discuss and research how colleges really have incredible opportunity to be transformative and to be um, these leaders in moving toward climate justice because um, they're t they tend to be very wealthy, they tend to be anchor institutions, which is um, basically an institution that's just very closely tied to its community. Um, this is very prevalent in Boston. We have a lot of universities that are like inseparable from the community. Um, it also tends to refer to hospitals, um, big nonprofits, things like that. Um, so universities are anchor institutions, which puts them in this position where they can have a huge influence on how the city and the community are affected by and responding to climate change. Um, and so we have all these opportunities to create real climate justice approaches. Um, and so the paper essentially looks at what colleges and universities are doing now and then how higher education could move toward more climate justice. Um, this is one quote from the paper. When the climate crisis is framed as a scientific problem in need of a technological fix, public discourse and imagination on changing the underlying societal and economic structures is constrained. Um, so there's just, we're really limiting ourselves when we look at climate justice this way. Um, and we're imagining universities that can be leaders. Um, and we essentially did this by looking at what universities can do in terms of these two climate justice frameworks, um, which are Green New Deal type policies and energy democracy. So are you, how many people are, have heard of the Green New Deal? This is CSSH, this makes sense. <laughs> um, so there was the Green New Deal introduced in Congress, uh, I think it was 2017, I could be wrong. Um, but so after that, many Green New Deal type policies that are modeled after this national policy have been popping up um, inter internationally, honestly. Um, there's Green New Deals for Cities, Boston M Mayor Wu is, um, has a sort of Green New Deal policy that she's working towards. Um, but these are basically large public investments in clean energy that are linked with large investments in labor, health, education, and other social justice work to increase resilience. So usually um, involves like a governing body, and in this case it would be the university, in many cases it's a city or country, um, but this governing body making these investments not only in um, changing our energy structure, but in linking that with um, socioeconomic changes. The most common example being like funding for education for green jobs. So. Um, making sure people have access to training for jobs, but making sure these trainings are also jobs that will help us move into this sustainable future. Um, but there's a, lot of there's a lot of different examples of how specifically um, those Green New Deal type policies will work. And then energy democracy is this other framework um, that is a tr about more about the how we transition. Um, so Green New Deal policies have a lot of um, ideas on ha ideas on specific like actions that we can take, um, but energy democracy focuses more on how like the process is created for making those things happen. So it's transformation to a renewable based future that can also redistribute social and economic power. So it um, is more about challenging existing frameworks um, because Green New Deal type policies you can. It, it might not like totally honor climate justice, but you can do it within current frameworks. Um, so energy democracy challenges these frameworks through resisting fossil fuels, 
reclaiming decision making power um, around how around how um, decisions about energy and resilience are made, and then restructuring our just the way things are done, essentially. Um, and we, we can talk more about specific examples in a little bit. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I, <clears throat> All right, well, to quickly expand upon the pillars that Sophie uh, established, um, under those two pillars, there are eight different tangible ways that universities can implement change to address uh, climate justice. Um, so under the guise of the Green New Deal and a more climate justice focus on society, um, there's potential to um, pursue emissions mitigation with renewable energy standards and reductions in emissions. Um, next is the education and labor. Um, so pairing, um, paying your employees a fair wage and creating good jobs that um, kind of involve underinvested communities. And then thirdly, um, pursuing infrastructure and investing in renewable energy and retrofit projects. Um, next, there would be um, health and healthcare initiatives, um, ensuring that all members at the university community have access to adequate and equitable delivered health care. Um, and lastly, under the Green New Deal um, side of things, the social equity clause and prioritizing involvement uh, feedback when appropriate and leadership from um, representatives in the local community. Um, and then next, um, so the other way to pursue climate justice would be through the energy democracy side of things. Um, firstly, that would be through resisting fossil fuels, um, including but not limited to divesting end endowments from fossil fuels and resisting fossil fuel industry research. Um, the second way would be to restructure power systems. Um, this includes um, co-designing and co-producing local renewable energy projects, including microgrids, virtual power plants, um, and demanding management programs. And then lastly, under the energy democracy side of things, would be to reclaim energy decision making. So higher education institutions um, switch their focus from a prioritization of corporate interests to prioritizing public interests by means of genuine partnerships with neighboring communities. You can give us your call. Okay. Um, well, I had quite a bit, but um, I will just highlight this quote from our paper. Um, so it reads, prioritizing climate justice is an opportunity for colleges and universities to commit to leading the way and ending fossil fuel reliance, including shifting how they invest endowments and eliminating unethical petrochemical funding sources to realize this potential. Higher education institutions need to resist corporate influence and recommit to advancing the cutting edge of research and practice for the public good. Um, so we do have um, more information about how to access the full paper. It's 29 pages and, and pretty comprehensive, including um, our sources for this presentation. Um, as well as some contact info if you would like to learn more. And let's have you both stay there, and now you can kind of move a little toward the um, toward the screen, and if our other presenters from this panel, um, so you can go on that side and balance them there, and then the other three can go here. Can you give me a thumbs up or down? Okay, we're good. Um, so I'm going to turn things uh, back over to Professor Bochkovar. Um, to invite questions from the audience or ask questions yourself or? Absolutely. So um, we're open to questions. And Jen, do we have anything Not from yet. the chat? I will just put another reminder. Okay. Mm, may I start?
So I'm Laura Green. Remember, we're supposed to identify ourselves, um, the Associate Dean for Teaching, Learning, and Experiential Education, and loved all of these papers. And I do have a question for a couple of the um, panelists, but I also just wanted to highlight what I thought was sort of a cool through line that emerged, which is that, and other people may have seen other ones. That's always what I think is sort of fun about these panels, but I felt like for each whatever you want to call it, problem, right, that you were talking about, there was a dialectic between a kind of society level issue or approach and an individual level issue for approach or approach. So you all highlighted, um, and I mean, they took different forms, but I feel like the, you know, the energy democracy version is a more not individualistic but individual approach in the sense of like person first rather than corporation first whereas the green new deal is maybe a little more corporatist i did though just want to take the moment to highlight that boston's very first director of green infrastructure in the city of boston um because that's what i said boston is a 2008 graduate of uh, CSSH in political science and international affairs. Her name is Kate England, kind of confusingly, but um, you should get in touch with her. Um, but so, and then in um, in Angelina's uh, paper, which I do have a question about, there were also sort of what you might call individual level kinds of behaviors or sort of more individual stress, like Maybe stubbing my toe really upsets me, but not other people. Um, and then these kind of huge societal issues, right, like war. Um, and um, in uh, in Sharon, Sh Sharon, Shannon, yeah, Shannon, in <laughs> Shannon's um, paper, um, again, you really highlighted that there are impacts for the individual um, genocide victims as well as these kind of actions by larger um structures and then in Aries paper similarly like there's these kind of social issues like stereotype threat that are felt on an individual level so maybe that's obvious i thought it was really cool i mean i think it's um maybe something that social sciences and humanities enable you to move between these kinds of levels um and really keep both of them in mind I wanted to ask my question, and I'm, I'm not going to talk forever, I promise, but I wanted to ask my question of Angelina, um, and it's sort of about a, something that might come between these two levels. So my background is actually in English and WGSS, um, and also I'm old. So what I sort of remember about... Hold on a when I was thinking about domestic partner violence, um, it used to be, I'm really putting this all wrong, but it's okay. I'm used to thinking about it in a feminist framework. Yes. So that framework is really about cultural attitudes, patriarchal attitudes. I mean, and we didn't used to call domestic partner violence either, right? Like we used to, it, it was more gendered. But so I'm sort of, and you know, and that language is not really in your approach so much. Um, so I'm sort of just curious about how you would think about that or if there's sort of other places where it creeps in or yeah. if there's an upside to kind of not having that focus or, yeah. So we also did look at factors such as masculinity um, and power dynamics and we did not find them to be as strongly associated as other factors. Um, for me, there's like a few different frameworks in which you can look at domestic violence, perpetration and I think that giving the opportunity to expand our idea of victimhood in order to include men would be really strong, especially in a culture which might have a different definition of domestic violence than us. Mm -hmm. So if we are trying to operationalize a definition, to have one that is the most inclusive so that we can have the most accurate picture, even if it does kind of go against a historic framework, um, I thought would be, or we thought would be more successful. Yeah. Fabulous answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Laura, more questions? Hello everyone, great job today. My name is Kaylee Ward. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Um, I had a question for Hannah and Sophie. Um, 
one of the, I'm recently from Michigan State University, and one of the things that's happened there recently is um, faculty and students have organized around trying to uh, reduce uh, fossil fuel emissions by uh, divesting from uh, manufacturers who provide funding to the university through research grants and things like that. Um, and that was met with huge backlash within um, the university because um, that would affect Respectively, faculty's pay, uh, research funding, graduate students who are on um, a research assistant uh, ship, so they get their health care through that or, or other things. And I'm curious if you've seen something similar with other universities that may have tried to follow um, some of those different um, options to become uh, more climate justice focused, um, or if that's happened here at Northeastern University or things like that. The answer might be you don't know yet, but I just thought it might be an interesting discussion point for you to sort of talk about. Ooh. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Sophie's a little bit more involved in the North Northeastern community on that front, um, so I'll let them talk about that in a second. But I will just say that um, in my experience in the Boston community, um, Northeastern is kind of falling behind the mark um, because uh, universities like Harvard and Boston College did have success with um, divestment programs. Um, but in our community, it's still kind of in the activism um, stage of things because there are a few members of our board that have affiliations with ExxonMobil and other um, fossil fuel um, ties. and that's kind of a conflict of interest if you want to be kind of a leader in sustainability in Boston. So um, there are different clubs on campus like Sunrise um, and Divestment Northeastern that have been really um, kind of getting people uh, mobilized towards um, campaigning for divestment. Um, and recently there's an election going on right now for SGA um, with a divestment question in there as well for students to kind of put their opinions on. So, yeah. Yeah. so honestly, we didn't talk about this particular question in the paper, but I can speak to it as a member of Divest Northeastern and Sunrise Northeastern. Um, so the Divest campaign at Northeastern happened it, between like 2012 and 2016, something like that. So there was a huge Divest campaign. Um, and as far as I know, there wasn't a lot of student backlash. Um, it's interesting that that happened at Michigan. I, I wonder if it's like a regional difference or something like that. Um, Boston universities tend to be very progressive as far as what I've seen. Um, generally, like urban universities tend to follow this trend as well. Um, but so in 2016, there was the same SGA referendum for divest and there was a 75% yes um, from at least 20% of the student body, which was um, around what they get normally for voting. Um, it sounds low. Actually, it's this year, good. it's pretty good. This year, um, voting's been open for only a few days, and there's already like 12 or 13%. So it's open till Sunday if there are any undergrads. But anyway, um, yeah, that's interesting the backlash from students because this is something that we talk about a lot where that's one of the first things that people will ask is like oh if we divest will this raise my tuition or like will I not get paid will we not be able to pay faculty or staff as much um, and so there's two general answers to this question one is that there's that sort of falls into the trap of either or thinking that we want to get away from um, if we're trying to resist these current structures um, that tends to be like a a mindset based in white supremacy and colonialist ideas not that it's like particularly about the topic of white supremacy but these kind of um, frameworks that we're thinking of, of thinking of action through um, so we don't think that it's an either or. There's a possibility. There's, if we do it in a like community oriented process where we're where students and faculty and staff have a voice in the process of how we divest, then we should be able to redistribute wealth so that 
we are not raising tuition. Um, and then the second part of it is that a lot of people, there's a lot of new research being done about how divestment is in the long term going to be the more financially viable strategy because oil and gas industries are facing financial backlash um, and they're just kind of becoming less trustworthy in general as investments and so if you don't if you don't believe me that tuition won't be raised not you in particular but if people, if people like if you don't believe that they can do it without raising tuition um, then maybe that's the thing that you could look at is um, how in the long term it will be better financially for the school because less untrustworthy investments. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question? Yep. I, I don't want to belabor, but just congratulations to everybody. And, um, and I, uh, you know, piggybacking on Laura's theme about sort of a through line, I was really impressed to see um, how each of your presentations in their own particular way challenge conventional thinking, that there are the sort of more convenient or more comfortable answers, and I really appreciated the way that each of you used data to push back against that and, um, and to help us sort of identify new pathways. I have sort of a long and complex question for Shannon, so I just want to introduce it and not put the burden on you to try to answer it, but I really appreciated your presentation and um, and really thought deeply about this idea of kind of having a standard for genocide that other events um, and atrocities don't live up to, be it being a barrier to um, engaging. But I, I wondered um, the degree to which that impacts the invisibility of um, these other forms of genocide as compared to other factors, including sort of a Eurocentric bias that is sort of, you know, kind of, shy, you, know, you know, really diverted attention away from the Rwandan genocide or international lobbying by the Turkish government around the, you know, Armenian genocide and other factors. And so how we can think about the explanation that I think is really powerful that you provided alongside other explanations that contribute to the invisibility of these mass atrocities. And so how we can kind of think about multiple um, causes yeah. and situating this alongside others. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. Quick answer. I've done, um, oh, actually, the same semester, I did a research project for my um, Middle Eastern Studies course, and I focused a lot on, it was a comparative study between the Yemen crisis and the Syrian crisis, mm -hmm. and a lot of what I worked on was kind of how the reason why these crises are so bad is because, like, again, the Eurocentric mindset, and how a lot of, even like what we see in Ukraine right now, a lot of European countries are opening their arms to refugees and saying, you can come here until the war is over. We're keeping a close eye on you and making sure that like Russia isn't getting other NATO countries involved. But in Syria and Yemen right now, obviously, European countries are not opening their arms. So obviously, that is a very prominent uh, the ideology and thinking because these people are not white. They are not Christian. And unfortunately, they're not fitting into how Europeans want to bring them in and give them the same amount of reparations that they are doing for Ukraine and Russia right now. And in no way am I saying that they're doing enough for Ukraine and Russia right now, because um, what's going on there is absolutely atrocious, and there is not news coverage at all, and at least not substantial news coverage. Um, but it is important to bring in race into all these questions, which obviously I mentioned during the Rwandan genocide. But um, even right now in the Balkans with the European Union, both Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina have put in their... Um, applications, I guess, to join the United, uh, the European Union. And they have been both denied, but not for the reasons you might think. <laughs> Unfortunately, Bosnia has been denied because their economy is currently in shambles, but that is because of the genocide and how there's not able to be negotiations between the two ethnic groups. And I can go on and on about the governmental um, style in Bosnia, but in short, it's basically three presidents, each of the three main ethnic groups, the Croats, the Serbs, and the Bosniaks. And in order for any legislation to be passed, all three must agree. And with these tensions, they're not agreeing. <laughs> and Serbia did not get um, selected to join the U uh, European Union, not because of the genocide, but because they're not acknowledging Kosovo as a country. So it is a lot to think about how there's really no um, representations towards anything. Yeah. But I'm really impressed with the way that you sort of mediated between all of this complexity across your cases. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent.
Um, we have one more minute of probably before we have to wrap up. Any last minute questions? Yes. Um, just a real quick question for Sharon. Again, really good job. Uh, in your mind, what separates like a large atrocity from a genocide? <laughs> so, <laughs> very. I took um the uh, Holocaust and creative genocide course last semester, which is basically the entire discussion. <laughs> so one of the first things that Professor Natalie Foreman said to us in that class was, is 9-11 considered a genocide? And that is something that actually had the entire class kind of thinking, whoa, like, is it? Because at the end of the day, people were killed for radically no reason. But in my opinion, um, what separates a genocide from a regular mass atrocity is the fact that usually, like, the other side has no physical means of effectively fighting back. It's a power dynamic, and it also has to do with the extreme, like, kind of public propaganda in a way. Like, if the whole country is just putting all of their frustrations onto one group and individual, not only in the physical sense of physical harm, but also politically, economically, socially, like, it cannot, it can go far between a physical genocide and an economic genocide and a political genocide. But I guess if it's all encompassing, like it's really hard as you know, but that would be my short answer. Cool. Okay, thank you all very much for your presentations. And thank you. For those who are just joining us, I am going to repeat a couple of things that I said at the beginning of the first panel, so please bear with me. Um, one is reminding everybody that I am Laura Green and uh, I am the Associate Dean for Teaching, Learning, and Experiential Education in the college. Um, I also just want to encourage our speakers to speak slowly. We have plenty of time in the, um, in the program. We do have people following along online and we have sign language interpreters, and we have like old people who get distracted, like me. So for all of those people, it's really great um, if you can take your time in doing your presentation. I am now very pleased to introduce the moderator for our second of three panels, um, Heather Street Salter, Professor of History. Okay, well, I'm very excited about this second uh, panel and, and this uh, URF presentation day um, called Revision and Resistance. And first, we are going to hear from Grace O'Mara. Is it O'Mara? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yep. Okay. Oh, okay. O O'Mara, which do you prefer? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's Grace O'Mara or O'Mara. Yep. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about a fascinating project called Persephone's Garden. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Grace, and um, I'm super excited, passionate, and nervous. So if I talk fast, please just let me know. Um, but I'm thrilled to have the opportunity today to discuss a research project I was able to construct last semester while working at Signs and the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department. Um, today, I will be talking about Persephone, Greek goddess of spring and queen of the underworld. Let's see if the clicker, yes, awesome. Um, so I've always had a fascination with retellings. As a kid, I quickly devoured fairy tales in any form they took. So when I learned that hearing the stories I loved in a different option, sorry, in different worlds was an option, a whole new world of content became available to me. Waitress, pop star, cyborg, all of a sudden Cinderella could be more than assumed to be princess. I watched countless movies and read numerous books that engaged with narratives I knew by heart, but in fun and creative ways. I was especially attached to a collection of poetry titled A World's Wife by Carol Ann Duffy, which gives voice to literary, biblical, and historical female figures. When I was told I would get to undertake an independent research project as a part of my co-op, I was ecstatic. I knew that this opportunity to dive deep into a feminist topic of exploration um, of my choosing would be my chance to explore retellings in the way that I wanted, uh, unrestricted by form and free to be adventurous. I could also tell you I spent a lot of time debating which figure to pick, but that would be untrue. I had been in the palm of Persephone's hand before the seed of this idea even entered my mind. I had read and seen a variety of t material that engaged with the goddess and jumped on the opportunity to discover more. 
Um, and I was eager to explore what was it about Persephone that had myself and modern, modern storytellers entranced and like enchanted by her. So I spent months collecting artifacts and learning about who Persephone was in both historical and modern contexts. I generated a list of around 50 questions to help me really dive deep into the feminist potential of the queen of the underworld. More importantly, I knew I wanted to present my findings in a unique way. I didn't want to write a paper that referenced the materials I was engaging with, but rather ask the user to experience Persephone the way that I was. My exploration branched and tangled. Ideas intersected and became very challenging to fully unpack without moving on to an entirely new curiosity. And this part is certainly reflected in my research, this part of the process. So I think at this point, it would be helpful to kind of explain what the product was, like what I've created. Persephone's Garden is an interactive exhibit I've created to share my thoughts and the thoughts others have on the goddess and her story. Persephone's Garden has been made to mimic a metro map. I felt that the viewer would have to dive underground to fully understand her. I have acted as curator and cartographer and inserted myself, my interest, into my retelling of Persephone's story. This project was made, sorry, this project makes a point of highlighting the voices that are often overlooked in academic settings. It was my intention to challenge what retellings could be, just as feminist retellings have done in the past and continue to do. This exhibit was made so that anyone could explore the different threads of Persephone's story at their own pace. There are 23 stops that include a bunch of artifacts and analysis, and today I will only have the time to take you through a few really short ones um, and to give you context where we'll be starting at Welcome Persephone Girl, which is all the way on the left, and it's like the starting stop. Okay, let's enter the garden. Her story is not just crimson pomegranates. All of the splendor of spring bends to her will, but this floral maiden also sends shudders of fear with one delicate footstep through all of hell. She reigns over the birth of flowers and gentle beings, raises baby birds in her lap, lap and with fawns she plays. She reigns over demons and demis alike, and before her fury, even death himself pales. Persephone Girl by Nikita Gill, 2019. Welcome. You have arrived at the point of departure, the first stop on your journey. Persephone's Garden is a transportation service that can take you to a variety of destinations and sites. You hop on and off as you please, and you decide where you go next. The story of Persephone's abduction is at the center of Persephone's Garden. While some ideas go beyond this myth, uh, many modern and old stories utilize this specific narrative to talk about her and explore her. It is because of this that I normally, at the, the, sorry, because of this, the stop recommends that you look through a series of videos to get an understanding of what all of the different narratives are. Um, but because we're short on time today and I can't show you the videos, I'll just give you a more basic outline of the story that most people talk about. One day, Persephone is out picking Narcissuses when she is captured by and wed to Hades, her uncle and ruler of the underworld. Zeus, Persephone's father, had given Hades permission to do so prior to taking her, but without informing either the goddess or her mother. Demeter, um, Persephone's mother, searches for her daughter and either in a fit of rage or sorrow causes the earth to become a desert. Eventually, Zeus realizes that people are not sacrificing anything to him and sends Hermes to collect Persephone to get Demeter to bring back life. Before saying she can go, Hades gives pomegranate seeds to Persephone, which she consumes either by force, trickery, or choice, depending on the retelling. Learning that she has consumed the food of the dead, Zeus declares that Persephone will stay in the underworld one month for every seed she ate, thus explaining the changing of the seasons. So she'd go back with Demeter, you know, when she is, when it's summer, and then back to the uh, underground in the underworld when it's winter. Um, and let's, now that we have a basic understanding of the myth, let's talk about what Persephone's Garden, this exhibit, um, has to offer. We have five fully operational lines. Goddess and Queen is our magenta line on the top. Persephone goes by many names and takes many forms. And on this line, you can explore those identities to your heart's content. Here, you will learn more about her history, who she was, and who she's grown to be. It is impossible to discuss Persephone without mentioning her mother, which is why we offer Nurtured by Demeter, or the Green Line. Demeter was one of the 12 Olympians serving as the goddess of harvest and agriculture, and she plays a significant role in this myth. 
This line explores the relationship between Persephone and her mother, more specifically their origins, the intense devotion they inspired, and the multifaceted representation of mothers in retellings of this tale. If you so choose, you can dive deep into Persephone's story and utilize the plumb line, also known as Descent into the Underworld. While Homer's Hymn to Demeter does not show much of Persephone's time in the underworld, it is arguably the most critical component in understanding whether her story is one of trauma or empowerment. How does Persephone heal from her abduction? Does she embrace or detest her new role as queen of the underworld? What does she discover about herself now that she has been separated from her mother for the first time in her life? These are the questions this line seeks to answer. Burrow under the surface and into the underworld to learn more about Persephone's evolution, her agency, and the conflicting accounts of her relationship with Hades. How the story goes is our yellow line, which centers around the abduc abduction myth and its context. While exploring Persephone and her changing depictions as the primary goal, it is impossible to do so without unpacking the narrative she's so often personified alongside, and this line seeks to explore those themes of the ancient Greek texts. What is a feminist retelling? Who gets to decide what the original myth is and which voices are allowed to alter it? Whose voice matters? The red line, also called Retold Revive, attempts to answer these questions in relation to Persephone and her ever-evolving image. All of our lines seek to honor themes and motifs connected to Persephone. They strive to answer a range of questions that come up when exploring the goddess and her story. Art, poetry, picture books, musicals, video games, and more are employed to tour the versions of Persephone we see throughout history and in the modern world. Sometimes general statements are made about how certain types of works pre present Persephone and her story, and this is all based on a large sample of artifacts that I was able to explore and interact with. And the full list um, of all these artifacts can be found at our terminal station, which is at the very end, all the way on the right. And if you decide to travel solo after this presentation, which I hope you will, you will see notes throughout the map that ask you to visit a separate spot. These are suggestions, not requirements or demands. Some ideas in certain stops touch on things that are further explored um, more in depth somewhere else, and this is what the visit recommendation is for. So now we venture to my monstrous mother on the green line. While this stop centers Demeter, um, it certainly exemplifies the kind of feminist analysis it, present in this exhibit and highlights an important part of the tale, and it also was relatively short. <laughs> um, so while exploring a range of retellings that attempted to closely resemble the ancient Greek myth, it was difficult to determine which version of Demeter was more widely accepted, the mourning mother or the vengeful goddess. As we discussed, a key plot point of the narrative is the famine that Demeter causes. What seems to change based on the author is whether Persephone's uh, abduction causes Demeter to enter a deep depression or fit of rage. This distinction is significant because it determines if Demeter is characterized as a spiteful woman who knows how to use power as like leverage, or if she's a mourning mother, she almost accidentally stumbles upon this bargaining tool. It is most compelling to examine the vengeful iteration of Demeter, as it seems to have adapted itself accordingly to modern retellings of Persephone's story. A Demeter who knows she has power and uses it to her advantage is seen as hateful and uncaring of the lives she destroys. In modern retellings, Demeter is often presented and portrayed as an overbearing mother, unable to accept that Persephone has dreams and a desire to grow. In narratives where the relationship between Hades and Persephone is supposed to be read as positive, uh, Demeter is almost always sloppily and quickly given the label of antagonist. It is rare to find a story in which Persephone can keep both her lover and her mother. It's almost always clear to her which version she should side with, as the other is usually portrayed as evil incarnate. Um, and it is, of course, no surprise that Demeter is often portrayed in this negative light. There is an endless supply of movies and books that remind us that older women are monstrous. They long to have their youth and beauty back and will hold on to their daughters because of their jealousy and greed. And here, in this type of tale, Demeter's determination to get Persephone back is out of desperation, not love. It is also interesting to consider the level of destruction that both Demeter and Persephone cause. Newer stories enjoy when Persephone steps into her role and embraces her power, although this is something that usually portrays her enacting harm, albeit on characters who the reader of that story is supposed to think deserve this harm. 
What's interesting about that is Demeter is not offered these same affordances. When she hurts, it's unforgivable, and it's exa an example of a mother acting unhinged. Um, Demeter is not allowed to fight for her daughter in the same way as in more classical tales, uh, since the authors often portray her as undeserving of keeping Persephone in her life. In these stories, she's just an old woman doing what mothers in these type of, types of tales do best, which is act monstrous. Um, I briefly wanted to also touch on some of the ideas present in the stop's narrative agency in leaving victimhood. I'm not able to fully unpack them today, but I wanted to hit some of the main points because it is here that I impress upon the viewer the need to see Persephone and separate her from victimhood. And I, it is here that I argue that we must resist defining her by this pain and take her out of her context as a victim and stop seeing her in the state of perpetual victimhood. In many narratives, Persephone is depicted as having something, always depicted as someone who has things happen to her rather than someone who takes an active role in her story. It is crucial to consider both character and narrative agency in each of these artifacts because it determines how we understand her and what agency she has. As an audience, we need to shift away from rhetoric that promotes defining her by the moment she was weakest and instead acknowledge her for who she has grown to be. It is the nature of myth to change, and Persephone should be allowed to shed her victimhood if, that she is what, if that's what she chooses. But of course, again, that's dependent on the artifact. And I will point out my own hypocrisy in saying we started by saying Persephone's abduction narrative. Again, an example of defining her by this one moment where she was not empowered, where she was powerless. I think the most, to talk about the takeaways, there's a lot. Uh, obviously, I'm very passionate about this, but I think the most invaluable part to me was understanding the importance of challenging form. I have never had the opportunity to explore my research in such a creative way, and I felt free to do whatever. I mean, I created an exhibit, so it's very different from, you know, the traditional paper. I'm currently learning HTML to try to turn this into a website. It exists as a Prezi right now, but I'm hoping to move beyond that. Um, there's also so much more to say about Persephone and her story, but I think what really stands out to me is how much medium, how much I learned that medium and form affect a work's viewed sophistication and legitimacy. Again, going back to that question of whose voice matters and like what forms we're willing to accept retellings or adaptations. I must also confess I'm working on a similar project for my capstone and I plan to work with feminism and folklore for as long as humanly possible. Um, and I wanna say a quick thank you to everyone who supported me in this project, thank you. Um, and you really let me let my imagination run wild and I will follow this passion for as long as I can. I hope that you have enjoyed my short presentation on Persephone's Garden. Wow, Grace, thank you very much. I, I cannot wait to see the, the website. I also, I, I omitted to say that oh, Grace is an English major. I'm very sorry that I didn't say that before. It's in the, it's in the it is in there, that's true. But it deserves to be said. Um, okay, so our next panelist is Lauren Yule. Did I say that correctly? Okay, um, and Lauren is a history and political science major who is going to be talking to us about meritocracy's, meritocracy's might, identifying the segregationist rhetoric of Boston newspapers, 1963 to 2021. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, like you said, my name is Lauren Yule. I'm a second year history and political science major here at Northeastern. Um, and I'm very grateful to be speaking with you all today about my ongoing research, Meritocracy's Might, Identifying the Segregationist Rhetoric of Boston's Newspapers from 1963 to 2021. In 1963, Boston Public, uh, sorry, Boston Latin School, a rigorous uh, public 7 through 12 school here in Boston, began requiring applicants take an admissions exam uh, to mitigate over-enrollment due to the baby boom. In the past two decades, though, a, body, a growing body of research suggests that standardized testing has served as, or has unfairly favored white and Asian students in the admissions process. In the case of Boston Latin School, Black and Latinx students continue to perform worse than their white and Asian peers. 
in 2021, we can see that Black and Latinx students made up 72% of the Boston Public School District, yet only 23.9% of students attending Boston Latin School. The use of exams has restricted and continues to restrict Black and Latinx students' access to high quality education in Boston, perpetuating racial segregation. Let's take a look at how we got here. As we discussed, um, exam requirements were introduced in 1963 to mitigate over-enrollment due to the baby boom. Since then, Bostonians have debated this system across several educational crises, the first being the baby boom, the second being the Boston busing crisis, which began in 1974 when Boston public schools were under court order to desegregate. And this led to a period of racial protests and riots across the city. The third being the Westman versus Boston Public School Committee case. Um, this was a legal challenge, challenge against set-asides in the admissions process. The set-aside system required that 35% of seats uh, be set aside for Black and Latinx students uh, at Boston Latin School. Um, and it began during the busing crisis. Prior to the busing crisis in 1971, Black students made up 1.9% of Boston Latin School, yet 32% of the Boston Public School District. Unfortunately, or, however, the ruling in the Westman versus Boston Public School Committee case prohibited any consideration of race in the admissions process. Oh, sorry, I forgot the last one. Um, and then the last most recent period is the COVID-19 pandemic. This one requires a little bit more explanation. In 2020, Boston Public Schools could not administer their entrance exam. Instead, they admitted 20% of their students based on just grades and the other remaining 80% based on grades and zip codes, with some preference given for students from low income zip codes. In 2021, Boston Public Schools passed a new admissions reform, um, wherein starting in 2023, the exam requirement would resume, and 20% of applicants would be judged, or uh, sorry, 20% of spots would be given to applicants based just on their GPA and test scores, while the remaining applicants would be categorized into eight socioeconomic tiers, and an equal number of students would be admitted from each tier. Um, white and Asian parent backlash ensued after this, but the courts upheld the reform. During these four periods, uh, the debates about exam schools unfolded on the pages of Boston's newspapers. Advocates have argued that um, admissions exams offer a fair route for hardworking students to gain entrance to the schools, yet opponents have asserted that exams have institutionalized racial and socioeconomic segregation. With this in mind, I examine how has print media rhetoric about exam school requirements evolved or remained the same across exam school crises. Critically, language and rhetoric in print media shape public discourse and opinion. Thus, I aim to identify the language used to covertly defend racism and uphold the systemic exclusion of Black and Latinx students from exam schools. I should note that the articles I examine in my research do not explicitly have to be about race, but most covertly discuss race. Um, considering Boston's historic struggle to desegregate, I believe it is critical to both identify and denounce segregationist language in contemporary exam school debates. So to answer this question, I examine five of Boston's newspaper archives, the Boston Globe, the Bay State Banner, the Boston Herald, Sampan, and the Irish Times. This research is ongoing, so today I'll be talking about my methodology and results for the two newspapers for which I've completed my research. That is, includes the Boston Globe and Sampan. Um, the Boston Globe research process is super easy because their archives are completely digitized, so I can keyword search in Boston Latin School, exams, admissions, debates, any word like that, and it will yield every result for me. Sampan, however, is not yet fully digitized um, and available in its entirety only at the Boston Public Library on microfilm, which meant that to find any article discussing exam schools, I had to manually scroll through every single issue they've published since they entered print, uh, which set a significant 
time set back uh, in my research this semester. I was brought to my research by two academic works, the first being an article by Kimberly Provula Cedroni titled Bright Flight, Desegregating Boston's Elite Exam Schools. And in that article, she argues that Boston public schools are racially and socioeconomically segregated, as we've discussed. And she outlines the history and policy of why this is the case. And the second is a book called Why Busing Failed by Matthew Delmont who argues that Bostonians used the term busing to describe, debate, and oppose desegregation during the busing crisis in non-explicitly racist terminology. These works inform my findings today. Similar to Delmont, I find newspapers used the words tradition and quotas to describe, debate, and oppose desegregation in exam schools. Unfortunately, I had a, a description or uh, an example of an article, but I'll just say it out loud here. Um, so the most clear example of this is in a 1975 Globe article titled Hub Latin Schools Tradition Under Assault in Time of Integration. Reporting on, the court, on a court case that would increase minority enrollment to exam schools, the authors wrote, quote, another concern is that the admission of unqualified students will dilute the historic high standards of a school which prepares students for college." End quote. Yet, as we discussed earlier, Boston Latin School had only introduced exam requirements 12 years prior to the publication of that article. Would exams really be considered a, tr a tradition by that point in time? In this case, I argue the term tradition is actually used to defend maintaining segregated exam schools. I also argue that authors use narratives supporting meritocracy to de describe and oppose to segregation. I realize that's an umbrella term, but to identify and analyze rhetoric and narratives supporting meritocracy, I employ the Oxford Dictionary of Sociology's definition of meritocracy, which defines it as, quote, a social system in which status is achieved through ability and effort, merit, rather than ascribed on the basis of age, class, gender, or other such particularistic or inherited advantages." End quote. So I find that authors use phrases such as qualified, rigor, work hard, and striving for excellence. In these cases, the authors argue that students who work hard or are qualified and therefore receive high test scores should be admitted to exam schools, covertly arguing that Black and Latinx students do not work hard and are not qualified because they do not receive high test scores and should therefore not be admitted. Notably, my results are preliminary, which is why I'm excited about what's next. Um, the, uh, sorry, uh, the first step or, or next step in my research is performing a Python sentiment analysis on these articles. This is a data science methodology which can reveal the word and phrase frequency as well as tone of the articles I've researched. Um, and this would provide more concrete evidence for my hypotheses. And I'm really excited about this part because it would be combining traditional humanities research uh, with contemporary data science methodology. And I'm also looking forward to completing my research on the Banner, Herald, and Irish Times archives. With all this in mind, I am left questioning, from a historical standpoint, where else can we identify these segregationist narratives? Do they prevail in exam school debates such as those in New York City or San Francisco? From a communication standpoint, how can we mitigate the perpetuation of segregationist narratives in contemporary print media debates? And from a public policy and education standpoint, why are high quality educational opportunities limited in the first place? If demand is so high, why can Boston public schools not meet it? Thank you all for your time today, and I look forward to answering any questions. And if we can just ask uh, Grace and Heather to return to the, um, yes, and if you could flank, let's see, Heather, if you want to move next to Lauren. Yep, you're good. Okay. You stay there, you stay there. <laughs> Everyone's good. Nobody okay. wants to be next to me. Okay. <laughs> when they do speak, if they could walk closer to the microphone. Oh. Yeah, so why don't I stand over there? You guys stand over okay. here. Okay. I'm, I'm very loud. Okay. Oh, and okay? Okay. Okay. And the floor is open for questions, including from anyone uh, that we may have um, 
joining us by live stream. And uh, Professor Street Salter will call on people and moderate, Excellent. or even ask the first question if you would. I Actually, I do. I, yes. I have a question for each one of you. Um, Lauren, since you just went, I, yes. I, my question has to do with how you decided what words yes. to use in your study mm -hmm. to um, demonstrate segregationist, you know, because like, you're talking about covert mm -hmm. um, um, signaling. Yes. And so I wondered how you decided those words, because there was other Tradition there were other quotas. words in yeah. the quote that you used that I thought oh, also yeah. Yeah. were big red flags. Yes, <laughs> dilute, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I landed on those words based on my own perceptions of word frequency in my preliminary research. So um, the word tradition comes up, I think, at least 15 times for the Boston Globe in the 70s and 80s. And they're talking a lot about upholding tradition, like we have to maintain this tradition of rigor when exam requirements were only 10 or 15 years old at that point. Um, so while, of course, like terms like dilute are obvious huge red flags, I focused on words that I could find across the board, such as tradition or quotas. My guess is that there's some scholarship that would back up the that choice mm -hmm. of especially tradition. Mm -hmm. um, oh, certainly, and, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, Grace, I really just wanted to hear about. Well, I mean, I have lots of questions. Why do you think you're so interested in retellings, mm -hmm. um, and why Persephone? Why did Persephone have such a hold? Does yes, have, yes. Persephone has such a hold on you. Retellings more broadly, like I think there was kind of like that as a kid. Like I loved it, and I think there's this idea of like a reclaiming when we think about retellings, and I really think it draws into question, you know, like. Like, what are the stories we want to hear and which stories, like, are we pushing away? And I think that, like, it really was Carol Ann Duffy's, like, poetry collection that was, like, I was, like, there's something here in terms of, like, feminist analysis, but, like, like, all, like all these big questions. Persephone specifically, like, I should say I'm working on a project right now for my capstone about Brigid, uh, the Celtic goddess, a Celtic goddess, and I'm trying to turn it into a game. So it's like a completely different thing. But Persephone specifically, I think, is because of how much content there is about her. Because um, I'm finding the opposite with Brigid. Um, Persephone really like takes up cultural or like space in our like minds, and there's just so much about her um, that's been like not even reclaimed for every for every instance of the artifacts but like retold reused like i think also of Hades town like the musical which really focuses on like the importance of retelling narratives to unpack like what they mean in a certain cultural context and i think with her there's just so much to say about there's so much to say for my own feminist like interest i guess but there's so much also to say about like what does it mean that we care so much about this young girl's journey and like how do we present that um, in like different mediums and different forms? That's yeah. great. And I just wonder if there's maybe, and this is not a question necessarily, but maybe in, in your life there might be room for thinking about some of the historical stories that are constantly retold. Yeah. Just, I was thinking about Six because it was on the cover of our Northeastern magazine, yes. but I also saw it um, in London. Um, and just thinking about like, how why we retell stories and they sometimes look very very different yeah yeah it's definitely something i love to think about because it's like you're revamping it for like a new culture and you're trying to get like new people interested in history like with six and yeah. with Town. like you're trying to introduce and hamilton even even yeah. i guess like you're trying to give history like a new voice but like what does it mean when we change what the, the we change what the history was and I think like that's what the, the that's what's interesting because yeah. you know like six like it definitely embellishes and it definitely oh, like yeah. and that's what makes it interesting yeah. though I think yeah yeah no it, it's awesome okay yeah um, <laughs> before I see that you have a question I have oodles of questions but I am going to limit myself to two and actually one um, I need a visual aid for Jen. Would you be able to, or or actually, or um, could you scroll back to? This is actually going to be a question for both of you. Back, back, back. <laughs> One more. There we are. Okay. So this slide reminded me of Grace's um, 
uh, fabulous um, metro. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, it really could function the same way, right? Because behind each of those little circles, you could have, um, you know, all of the, like, you could have artifacts associated with the baby boom, and you could have materials associated with the bus crisis and blah, blah, blah. It could function in a similar way. So I guess my question, which is a little inchoate, I mean, on the one hand, I'm thinking, these have all been great um, PowerPoints, by the way, that people have had. And they are so different. Uh, remember PowerPoints from the beginning of PowerPoint that some of our dear colleagues, unfortunately, like, you don't all have your skills. And it's like, <laughs> here is a slide with all of these words on it. And it's like, but I'm listening to words. Like, I'm good with the words, right? But so these are much more creative uses of PowerPoint. And actually, I forgot, Grace, that your thing at the moment is still a Prezi, not, in fact, the website that it needs to be, um, So, which is a form of PowerPoint, right? Yeah. <laughs> so my question, again, which is general and for both of you, is sort of like, how do you... As you know, the rising generation of both still learners, but also probably future scholars or, or you know, information contributors, how do you think we should be thinking about having people present their research? Like what, you know, what do you feel is the best way of capturing, conveying? Do you see what I'm asking, kind of? So, okay. Do you want to start? I uh, I can, I can yeah. contribute a little bit. I mean, I am clearly a PowerPoint lover. <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't have the most concrete thoughts on this, but I have also definitely seen a huge variety of types of PowerPoints, like the, you know, blocks of text or like, mm. here's one word. And then you're, you know, if you're out sick that day or, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, at least my process for any type of presentation is I just want this to provide a clear visual aid that can help someone follow along with what I'm saying. Um, and so I really try to lean away from to anything text heavy. Um, but I agree that this like types of presentations like this can can uh, help maintain like like strong visual aids help maintain the viewer's interest um, and yet still make what's being said important. Yeah, I think for me there. Sorry, I think for me there are kind of two things. The first is I have a background and I've done research in digital humanities since I was a freshman. I'm now fourth year. Um, and I think that's made me really think about like how we portray information, but specifically visually and connected to the digital. I also think the other reason or why specifically I've laid out my research this way or decided to present it as like an exhibit is because I didn't want to, like I kind of explained earlier, I didn't want to write a paper. I wanted someone to, with literally no knowledge of Persephone, to be able to be a user and interact with the research. It really like learn from their choice and their journey um, and like take part in, and understanding also maybe back to your earlier question about like why I'm interested in retellings, like to understand the retellings are happening and like it is your job as a user to like take part in that learning and that process and like you are allowed to do the retelling. I know that's kind of, I branched out, but it's kind of why I've decided to portray the information in this way or present it that way. I guess if I can just have one follow-up, what I mean, I, I did this with the last panel, too. I love finding the through lines. There's always a through line. And what I'm seeing here is, in a way, these are also retellings, right? I mean, this is, um, it's the same story of racism and segregation, right? But it gets different, I guess every decade gets the crisis it deserves or something, but it gets different... Um, Rhetorics, as you're pointing out, and different um, sort of organizing crises to kind of um, as sort of the rebar that, that holds those rhetorics together. And so, it, again, it does seem to me there's a way that, like, I don't know, these two projects could sort of, their ethoses could come together, like, and you also, Lauren, could present the reader or the user, like something where a user would be like, oh, like what was the 1990s version of this particular? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. And I think that's also the like historian's challenge is trying to, you know, there's hundreds of smaller crises between these 
and this is certainly an oversimplification of Boston's history of, of desegregation. So absolutely, it's its own challenge of how do you retell the story without losing the, the critical information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well said. <laughs> okay. Questions, Jen? Do we have anything online? Okay. Um, this is outside of like your area of interest, but I don't know if you're familiar with the podcast. I think it's called Nice White Parents. Uh, yes. Yes. This is nice thing. White Parents. Yes. 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 By New York Times, and yeah. they talked a lot about the interest groups of parents and how they contribute yes. to these school crises in terms of segregation. Did you see that in this literature at all? Because mm -hmm. I know it's that was in New York City, and then this is in Boston. So there was definitely. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think it's it's ultimately the parents who are who are the first people to voice their concerns, and that's an excellent podcast. I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, uh, it's been a minute since I've since I've looked at the the literature that looks at the parents' side. Um, there's a there's a fascinating article. I think it's like uh, disrupting the racialized status quo of exam schools in Boston that was published last year um, about the like COVID nineteen pandemic and the the role of uh, parents and in, in parent advocacy, so it's certainly an interesting topic. So I don't have like piercing critical analysis about it. Do you but. look at op eds too? I mean, yes, you, yeah. So I everything, mean, and, yeah, and letters to the editor as yeah. well. Yeah, okay. yeah. There's a recent op ed in the Boston Globe <laughs> by our next um, moderator, uh, oh, Professor Regine Jean-Charles. Oh, yeah. 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 Be interested in what is the title of it again, Regina? So it's about the calculus project. Oh, it's it's actually a very cute title. It's like critics of my kids' math program have their calculus wrong. Okay. <laughs> and it's about the calculus project, which is a project aimed towards black and brown kids to increase the number of kids in um, that that do higher levels of math. Um, we have one in our town, and now a national organization called Parents Defending Education that is basically a right wing organization um, that you know attacks any programs related to uh, black and brown kids or anything yeah. that they suspect might be what their version of critical race theory. Um, using affirmative action, you know, in the same way that we're seeing with the, the attempts to dismantle that, right? So. Defending. I bet that would be another word for yeah. your oh, yeah. 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 I will send the link yeah. to yeah. Professor yeah. Charles' yeah. articles. Yeah. 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 Question here. Yes. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Miranda. Um, I have kind of a question for both of you, but to direct it, I, each of you separately, if I can. My larger question has to do with narrative, sorry, na um, narrative agency and structure. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, because in some ways I'm interested in how you both made, by doing your presentations, you both took on all this narrative agency and inserted your own voices in these really established stories, and that's this incredibly courageous, disruptive, powerful choice. Mm -hmm. And so then, coming out of that appreciation, one of the questions I have for Warren is, there's something that happens a whole lot in journalism that can't always be captured by a keyword search, which is the journalistic structure that begins with a really relatable, heartwarming story, mm. and then mm. kind of, yeah. you know, mm. comes full circle That's and right. ends <laughs> with that story. And I am wondering if you observed whose stories were told, who, is, who effectively so serves as the sympathetic, as the protagonist or the focalizer in these, you know, in this reportage. Absolutely. So I'll start by explaining. So the Boston Globe, Boston's um, newspaper of record, uh, but also largely caters to a. Uh, largely white and middle or upper middle class audience. Uh, and then the Sampan uh, was Boston or Chinatown's newspaper um, and is actually a bilingual newspaper. So it is published both in um, English and in Chinese in the same publication. Mm. Um, so in the Boston Globe, it is always, 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 at least in my memory, um, the white student who just barely didn't get in. Um, so actually, the I didn't elaborate too much because I would get too far in the legal wormhole, but the Westman versus Boston Public School Committee case was actually um, Westman sued on behalf of his daughter, who was uh, the first student who didn't make the cut um, after finding out that a black student had been admitted who had worse test scores than she did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in the Sampan, it's it's also like the 
it's spoken to more in a mass. It's not like a, as much of an anecdote. There's also much less data points because it's not published every day. It's published uh, bi-weekly. Um, but the few articles that I was able to find in the Sampan talked more broadly about Asian students as a mass not being accepted. Yeah. Great. So my question, I mean, this is just one of the many things that I love so much about your project is the way you created journeys within these narratives. You created these larger meta journeys. And that's one of the really creative and kind of extraordinary interventions you're making is that these aren't necessarily the stories a lot of people would put together. Mm -hmm. You are really kind of pulling out unexpected threads by by pulling them together, and I'm wondering what your guiding principles were, and not only how you kind of situated different stories as stops along the lines, but also how you ordered them, how your sense of narrative flow among the stops went. Why why are some earlier and some later along these lines? Yeah, it, great question, and I'm sure it was a very long process after I kind of did a big analysis of all of the uh, artifacts. And you might remember in my office, I had a bunch of different sticky notes, all of different colors to represent each line and each stop. And I kept changing them around, trying to shift what would be best for like one line, what would be best for another and where would be the nice ending point. Um, I think that for me, there were, I really just followed what my heart told me. And that's where I think like my, myself being like curator and cartographer of it, like it's what I, my gut said, um, and how I felt I was experiencing her journey, uh, Persephone's journey, and therefore wanted other people to experience. Like there's a stop called Hushed Voices that points out fan fiction, particularly as like an example of times, basically retellings that we deem not important because they're often written by communities that we don't think deserve of a voice in our like media um, or like understanding of what's acceptable and sophisticated. And I think even though like that's just an example of like, I just really put my own like what I felt needed to be there there. And then I spent a really long time like tweaking everything to make sure like it made sense to me, but also would make sense for other people. Yeah. We are at time. Yes, thank you both very much for this fantastic panel. I just want to make for a third time, some of you will now have heard this three times, but some of you are just joining us and will be hearing it for the first time. A couple of housekeeping reminders. We have plenty of time on the program, so please speak slowly when you make your presentation. We have people following along with us um, remotely. We have sign language interpreters. We have people who've been here uh, since one o'clock and, you know, like our um, need to pay attention. So all of us will have an easier time if you don't rush your presentation. Um, that is the, I think, the only housekeeping announcement I need to make now. So I am delighted to welcome to the podium Dr. Régine Jean-Charles, our Director of Africana Studies, who will be moderating our third and final panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm so excited to introduce my panelists, especially because one of them is someone that I have grown quite close to, who's been my student, I think, three times now. Um, so congratulations to everyone in attendance who is presenting. This is really exciting, and I think one of the things that is um, one of the distinctive features of um, CSSH. So our panelists for today are Jania Brown, who is a major in international affairs with a minor in black feminist studies. The title of their presentation is A Resistive Practice, Black Lesbian Anthologies. Our next presenter is Jacob Horowitz, politics, philosophy, and economics major. The title of their presentation is Governing True Beliefs, Responding to the Epistemic Challenges of Democracy. And lastly, we have Ryan Baylon, whose major is philosophy and environmental studies and data science. I don't know if that's a triple major or if that's a major in two minors, but I'm sure we'll we learn more. We need parentheses <laughs> and like operators. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and the title for that talk is, that project is What We Owe Wild Animals. So please join me in welcoming them and they will go in the order of the, uh, that I just announced them. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Junia. Good afternoon. Uh, for my research, um, I want to start with, I'm going to run through sort of the idea of it, then run through some examples. Um, for my research, I started with wanting to understand how black lesbian writing opposes oppressive structures like heterosexism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. As someone who shares this identity, it was important to me to understand how it functions in society and radical feminist and political spaces. In particular, I wanted to understand how the existence of black lesbian writing contributes to rebellion and creates visibility for black lesbians, which is a form of rebellion in itself. Through my research, I found black lesbian writing is not only intentionally resistant to oppressive structures, but it is inherently resistant due to the fact that it asserts black lesbians' right to exist, be visible, and self-define for themselves. The word resistive, coming from black lesbian feminist Cheryl Clark, was chosen to exemplify this inherent resistance as opposed to a purposeful or intentional resistance. In praxis, meaning practice and theory, black lesbian writing is inherently resistive both in its content and presence in radical feminist traditions. It is important to understand how black lesbian texts are resistive as it can inform radical politics and radical feminisms. Anthologies were chosen as they provide a multiplicity of black lesbian voices and perspectives. No piece alone can encapsulate the resistiveness of black lesbian writing, and using anthologies provided a more comprehensive understanding of this topic. It is important to acknowledge that even four anthologies cannot fully encapsulate black lesbian writing and experiences. In addition, anthologies are collaborative. I used a black queer feminist framework to analyze these anthologies, coined by Charlene A. Caruthers, a black feminist and activist, which emphasizes the collaborative nature of black feminist and black queer feminist praxis. As previously mentioned, this framework also emphasizes the representation of multiple experiences within a community. This framework itself is resistive as it centers black and queer people in political praxis, something that doesn't happen often. Finally, anthologies are a useful tool for radical feminist writing as they preserve and reestablish historic texts while presenting new ideas to an audience. This makes anthologies an ideal format for black queer feminist writing. The four anthologies that I examined were Afriquete, an anthology of black lesbian writing, edited by Catherine, Catherine E. McKinley and L. Joyce Delaney, Does Your Mama Know, an anthology of black lesbian coming out stories, edited by Lisa C. Moore, Les Talk, a collection of black lesbian short fiction, edited by S. Andrea Allen and Lauren Shirell, and Mouths of Rain, an anthology of black lesbian thought, edited by Breonna Simone Jones. I selected these anthologies as they have various subject matters, writing styles, and focuses. They also span a large period of time, with Afriquete being released in 1995 and Mouths of Rain being released in 2021. The next step of my process was reading and analyzing each text. During this process, I annotated each piece within the anthologies and noted major themes within them using a spreadsheet. This process allowed me to synthesize my thoughts about each piece and also track what was recurring between the anthologies. With pieces in various writing styles, such as nonfiction, fiction, personal anecdotes, and poetry, it was essential to know what the pieces had in common. It was important to provide a variety of examples that assert the resistive nature of black lesbian writing to support my hypothesis that all black lesbian texts have a resistive nature. After determining the common themes between the pieces, I narrowed down the recurring ideas I was seeing into larger themes. This process meant understanding how certain ideas fit together and, related, and were related to one another to better sort them into meaningful categories. From these larger categories, I chose the best examples from each one. I reread my annotations and notes to determine which pieces best exemplify a resistive nature. Then, once again, I created larger categories that I could use to organize my final paper. Finally, I chose the best examples from each category and outlined how they fit into a resistive praxis. I used quotes as well as my own analysis of the pieces to support my hypothesis. From this, I wrote my paper and created my research poster. I also continuously blogged on this process on a research blog that I created for this project. The four categories that I sorted these pieces into were overt expressions of sapphic desire, self-definition, radical politics, radical political thought, and exclusion, silence, and erasure. Overt expressions of sapphic desire challenge heterosexist norms about sex, romance, relationships, and family structures. This expression of sapphic desire challenges societal structures intended to erase the black lesbian identity. 
Historically, a vast majority of writing about lesbians was written by men to, to fulfill their fantasies. This representation takes away from lesbian self-definition and autonomy by defining what the lesbian experience is without experiencing it. And this imposed definition is filtered through a heterosexist and patriarchal lens. For black lesbians, this definition is especially harmful as the intersection of blackness and lesbian identity creates unique experiences that others may not face. Overt expressions of sapphic desire between black lesbians written by black lesbians are resistive as they automatically go against heterosexist, white supremacist, and patriarchal beliefs. An example of the resistive nature of black lesbian overt expressions of sapphic desire is Alice Walker's poem, Can It Be? As previously mentioned, many lesbian narratives are eroticized for men. Alice Walker's piece expresses romantic desire for a female partner, which contrasts the overly sexualized portrayals of lesbians that are often presented in media. Specifically, Walker's piece shows this love from a black woman's perspective. As lesbian visibility in the media increases, it is important to tell a variety of stories from a variety of backgrounds. Overall, this piece resists against oppressive structures by challenging common beliefs and portrayals of lesbians, especially black lesbians. I found that self-definition is not only vital for black lesbian survival and visibility, but it is also a key part of the framework I use to analyze these pieces. Kyla Story, an author of Mouths of Rain, states both queerness and blackness to me have meant not letting society, institutions, friends, or loved ones define who you are or who you hope to be. The centering of the individual experience, self-definition, and self-discovery are recurrent themes in the text contained in these selected anthologies. Self-definition allows Black lesbians to define themselves outside of oppressive lenses. It creates space for positive, realistic, and honest depictions of the Black lesbian experience. It's a vital part of dismantling oppressive systems as it denies, the, it denies them the power of defining communities through these lenses. And not feminine as in straight, but femme as in queer AF, the queer black roots of my femme experience and expression, Kayla Story explores her femme identity and what it means politically and personally to be a black femme lesbian. She defines this identity as one that goes beyond white supremacist, homonormative, and patriarchal ideas of femininity as queer and queerness as white. She also draws on older black lesbian femmes experiences to define herself. Story's existence and assertion to be visible through her writing and theory is inherently resistive as it takes away power from oppressive structures definitions of black femmes. Even further, the mere existence of black femme lesbians as well as their writing resists against a binary understanding of gender and femininity. Black, lesbian, and radical political thought is resistive and resistant at the same time. Radical political pieces within these anthologies push boundaries politically by openly critiquing and seeking to alter existing political and academic structures. Revered black lesbian feminists, such as Audre Lorde, Cheryl Clark, and Pat Parker, represent the long history of radical politics in the black lesbian community. Black lesbian voices and political spaces are resistive as they challenge the attempted erasure and former ignoring of black lesbian voices by larger liberation movements. Black lesbian presence in queer, feminist, and black spaces has not always been accepted. Being politically vocal as a black lesbian is resistive as the acknowledgement and visibility of black lesbian voices, regardless of their politics, has not always been accepted. An example of radical political thought and black lesbian writing is Pat Parker's poem, Where Will You Be? This is also my personal favorite poem. In this poem, Parker puts forward a call to action to the queer community. The piece critiques inaction on the homophobic attacks experienced by queer people in the United States. With Parker saying, and where will you be when they come? Where will we all be when they come? And they will come. The community aspect of this poem aligns with the collectivity and collaborative nature of a black queer feminist framework. This piece is resistive as it challenges the norms set forth by heterosexism, heteronormativity, and other systems which we have become complacent with. It is also resistive in the way that it calls out a lack of solidarity within the queer community for those sharing different identities. The solidarity is often assumed but lost in queer political movements. Finally, I analyzed how black feminist anthologies are resistive in the way they fight against exclusion, silence, and erasure. As many of these examples have indicated, visibility for black lesbians is resistive in its nature. It inherently defies oppressive structures that would seek to ignore, destroy, or silence black lesbian voices. Beyond oppressive structures, there are many times throughout history when black lesbian voices have been excluded from queer, feminist, and black political movements. 
While visibility and acceptance in these movements has increased significantly over time, the intersection of blackness, lesbian identity, and femininity creates challenges for retaining visibility and being heard. The resistive nature of black lesbianism is exemplified by not only the continued writings and protests against this erasure, but also its pre mere presence within feminist, queer, and black liberation movements. In one of the pieces I analyzed for this section, Man Royals and Sodomites, Thoughts on the Invisibility of Afro-Caribbean Lesbians by Makeda Silvera, Silvera discusses the internal attempted erasure of black lesbians within Caribbean communities. She explains that lesbian, lesbians activism and black political movements is often ignored or dismissed due to homophobic and heterosexist beliefs. In this piece, she discusses how black lesbians are expected to hide their identity in order to work for black liberation. By bringing awareness to the issues faced by black lesbians, Silvera is fighting against the stereotypes of black lesbians from within the black community. Her bringing attention to this topic is resistive in the way that it highlights the attempted erasure of black queer people in this region. Bringing attention to society's attempted erasure of the queer community in this region adds another layer of resistiveness to this text. Thus, the resistiveness of this text is not only due to its critique of black liberation movements, exclusion of black queer people, but also due to the fact that it explores self-definition for the black lesbian community in a specific cultural context. These are a few of the many examples of resistiveness that I analyzed in this paper, and I hope to continue to expand on these ideas in my future research. The most important takeaway, the most important takeaway from my work was that there was a large need for more black lesbian writing and the centering of the black lesbian experience. It is important to hear black queer voices, and I believe that aligning with a black queer feminist framework can be a key for true liberation from heterosexism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. Black lesbian writing and black queer frameworks do not only serve black queer people. As stated by the Combahee River Collective, if black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free, since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. It is important to understand the resistive nature of black lesbian writing and its existence so that we can use this resistiveness to fight against repression. I also learned that anthologies are a great tool for radical feminist writing. Upon starting my research, I quickly found many sources highlight highlighting how anthologies have historically served radical feminist movements. Black lesbian anthologies expand on this by providing representation for a specific group of people that is often underrepresented. Anthologies represent multiple narratives within the same community, and most importantly, connect the literary to the political. They elucidate differences in perspective and politics that would otherwise not be presented together. Finally, this project helped me gain a greater understanding of my personal identity, and Black lesbian writing can do the same for others. Continuing to expand on Black lesbian feminist writing creates community and can be affirming for those who share the identity. Understanding how our presence is resistive, along with purposeful resistance, is a means for survival. It can validate who we are while expanding on our understanding of ourselves. I hope that editors and authors continue to write and collect works centering Black lesbians, and that further analyses of Black lesbian writing occur. I hope that this work continues to gain acknowledgement and larger political movements, as true liberation requires liberation for all. Black lesbian authors asserting the perspective and existence benefits us all. I encourage everyone here to learn more about Black lesbian writing and how it has paved the way for new and innovative ideas in politics, culture, and society overall. I will continue to center Black queer people in my work as I develop as a researcher, student, and an individual. I'd like to thank my family and friends, as well as my faculty ment mentor, Dr. John Charles, for all of their help and support in this process and everyone for their presence today. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we're going to be building towards a pretty radical proposal, which is that when seeking consent for policies which impose risk, governments are well justified in offering democratic participants information that is manipulated, low quality, or even untrue. Before we get there, we have to start at the beginning and start with risk. And so by risk, I, I simply mean the probabilistic chance of harm. And when we talk about harm, we usually mean setbacks to material interests. 
So this means losses in body or in rights or in property. And so risk is the chance of something like that happening. So let me offer an example. Imagine you arrive home after driving back from work or school or what have you, and you learn that just next to you on the freeway, barreling down at an unsafe speed, was a drunk driver. That drunk driver puts you at risk of a crash, of your car being damaged, and so forth. But it's not so clear what's bad about this. You didn't face a material setback because there wasn't a crash. You didn't even know that you were at risk. So why is it that we feel that there's something inherently wrong about this drunk driving example? There's something that the drunk driver did to us that just isn't quite right. And so we can find one answer to this question by looking at autonomy. So first, let's just make sure that we all understand autonomy. So when we talk about autonomy, we usually talk about plans and choices. So the autonomous individual is able to chart a course for their life. They're able to make a plan from a wide set of choices. And those should be good choices. This is because a choice between two bad choices is really no choice at all. So for instance, if you're stopped in the street by a mugger who points a gun at your head and says your money or your life, that's a choice. But this really is not a choice that's meaningful in the sense of autonomy. I mean, I think under really any other conditions, we'd pick a different choice. We would chart a different course. So in this sense, to be autonomous, we want good choices, preferably a lot of them. And we want to be able to pick from them and make plans and chart courses in our lives. And the, the case of the mugger, I think, is a good example of precisely how risk harms us. It alters the acceptability of our choices. Usually it does this by making our choices less safe. So for instance, let's return back to the, the, the drunk driving example. Our choice to drive home at that time, to continue to stay on the road, to get back home to watch, I don't know, our favorite TV show after work or what have you, is now less acceptable. It's less safe because we face a risk of a crash, a risk of hurting our body and our property. But today we're actually going to talk mostly about policies which impose risk. So let me offer an example in the policy realm. Consider the nuclear power plant. Oh, I might have a more updated version of my slides actually at the same link if you just refresh. Oh. Oh, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, let's keep going. Um, consider the nuclear power plant. So if we were to build a nuclear power plant in your neighborhood, you're, you face some risk. Nuclear power plants are famous for, at times, spectacularly melting down and harming those in the immediate vicinity. So while this is a, a low chance, those who are around the power plant certainly risk, face risk of harm. The acceptability of, say, staying in that neighborhood and continuing to live in that house has been lessened. It's less safe. And so in this way, we can say that their autonomy has been harmed. I'm ready for the next. Oh, I have. Oh. oh, I got it. OK. But there's a lot of reasons to want to pursue policies that impose risk. For example, in the nuclear power plant case that we were just talking about, you know, we're, fit, we're facing a sort of impending doom in relation to climate change. And so there's really good reason to want to shift away from fossil fuels and focus more on clean energy. And there's good reasons to pursue a number of other policies which impose risk, which I'd be happy to talk to or talk about afterwards, maybe as I field some questions. But um, the, the problem is that if governments don't get some sort of legitimacy, if they don't seek legitimacy for these sorts of risky policies, they enact them and harm the public. They harm the public by causing them to face setbacks in their autonomy. Their autonomy is violated. So how can we get this, this, this sort of legitimacy? How can we make this problem not so bad? So governments can get consent. They can ask people what they think. And so when, um, when one consents to something, they make a plan and they pursue it. They pick a choice and they chart a course with that choice. This is an, an exercise of autonomy. So when we consent to something, we are exercising our autonomy even if that choice limits our options, even if it may seem like it limits our autonomy. So let me offer an example. I have Post Malone here on this slide who has a number of face tattoos. We could all choose to get face tattoos, and this would limit our autonomy 
because it would certainly constrain our employment opportunities. For instance, you cannot enlist or earn commission in the armed forces if you have face tattoos. You just can't. I'm sure there's a lot of firms who have similar, maybe less explicit requirements regarding face tattoos. But if we make a decision to get face tattoos knowing that it's going to constrain our autonomy, that is an exercise in autonomy. We're charting a course for our life. We're making a plan. We're picking a choice that we think is good. It's not problematic. And so in this way, if the public consents to the risk imposition from policy, then that sort, those sorts of risks, those losses in autonomy, are no longer problematic. We've solved our problem. And so we can get this sort of consent from direct democracy or consultative democracy. And when I use these terms, I generally have in mind some sort of town hall, where people who are at risk and want to have their voices heard come to the town hall, get some information about the policy, and speak their mind. They say yes or no, they consent or dissent. And so I think that governments are justified in providing information that is of low quality, that is manipulative and incorrect, so that they can foster true beliefs. Now, to get to that conclusion, we have to do a little bit more work. So let's begin. These questions are of epistemic norms. So when we talk about epistemic norms in democracy, we're talking about the sorts of requirements we place on information provision and on the quality of that information and on the way that we form beliefs and whether or not those beliefs are true or false. And true beliefs are going to do a lot of work here. And so by true beliefs, I simply mean generally understanding the policies before us, understanding the objects of consent, that which we're considering. And so to have true beliefs about the power plant example, for instance, we would understand that power plants fail by core meltdown about every 3,704 reactor years, not, say, every five reactor years. That would be a false belief. And so there's some question as to why we should provide information in these democratic settings. And I think most of you probably think the answer intuitively is that it helps our participants understand what it is they're voting on. It helps them form true beliefs. And this is why we see in medicine the standard of informed consent. The goal is to help those who are considering surgeries or other operations have true beliefs and provide valid consent. And true beliefs are really important. They're needed for true beliefs. They're necessary. This is a pretty intuitive point. If you don't understand that which you're consenting to, it's very hard to imagine how that's valid consent. I mean, if you consent to hip replacement surgery and you thought it was a blood draw, like that's not, that's not valid. That, that there's just no way that that works. But here's the, the core problem that's going to motivate the rest of our discussion, which is that when it comes to considering risk, consuming high quality evidence does not lead to true beliefs. It leads to false beliefs. Human beings are really bad at risk judgments. We are terrible. When we consider probabilities and risk, our brains short circuit and we succumb to these biases, errors, and heuristics. Now, in my research, I've identified at least nine different sorts of these that prevent us from achieving true beliefs regarding risk. So for example, I'll just offer a couple and we can talk more about them afterwards. But um, consider the availability heuristic, which is the idea that we tend to overestimate probabilities of things that are easily available in our memory. So for instance, homeowners who live on floodplains are more likely to buy flood insurance when a flood has occurred in the recent past, say in the past few years, even though the probability of, the, of a flood is the same. Nothing's changed. They just are more, can more easily remember the last flood. Or consider probability neglect. Sometimes we struggle to, to even allow probability to enter into our belief formation because we are focused on the vividness and the fear related to the possibility of harm. So for instance, travelers will be willing to pay more for insurance which protects them against terrorism than insurance which protects them against losses from all causes, which of course includes terrorism. They are making a clearly worse choice simply based on the fact that, they don't, that they're unable to access probability in their reasoning. And so this is a big, a, a big issue. It seems now that by providing more evidence, we're not helping ourselves out. 
we're not getting to valid consent because we need true beliefs for the consent to be valid. And if we don't have true beliefs and valid consent, then these policies are going to end up harming people. So I think that we shouldn't provide information that's high quality. I think that true beliefs are too important. I think that we should provide information of whichever quality in whichever way ensures that we get these true beliefs. And that means even if this involves manipulating or altering or fudging information. And so I just gave a, a very basic justification for paternalism. This is that by altering the evidence we provide, we can achieve true beliefs and therefore valid consent and preserve the autonomy of our public. This avoids harm to autonomy or harm through losses in autonomy. But if you've been following what's going on, you may be very concerned. You may think this is crazy. Because in some ways, I've just proposed that the government should meddle in democratic institutions. They should alter the way that information is provided so that people form different beliefs and come to different conclusions and vote differently. This is sort of, sort of insane and really strikes at the core of the ways that we think democracies should function. But I think that this sort of framing isn't quite right. And I think if we take a closer look, we can actually see that this sort of paternalism is not just good for autonomy and risky policy, it's actually good for democracy writ large. So let's be specific about what's going on. I'm proposing veristic epistemic paternalism. By epistemic paternalism, I mean that we are interfering in the inquiry of our democratic participants. We do this by screening off evidence. The ways that they come to understand policy are altered because the evidence that is constituent of that process is altered. And by veristic, I mean that we have a very targeted, focused intervention for which the goal is fostering true beliefs. We are not affecting previously held preferences or commitments. So for example, if you underwent the veristic intervention about the power plan, you could still dissent afterwards based on a prior held commitment to say no construction in your neighborhood. These sorts of commitments and beliefs and preferences are not touched. Rather, we are focusing on non-normative beliefs. These are beliefs about how the world is, not how the world ought to be. So in this way, we're sort of just allowing our democratic participants to see the world more clearly. We're allowing them to understand the reality before them. It's as if we're having the nearsighted put on a pair of glasses so that they can well see clearly. But there's still some question whether or not this alters beliefs, right? You can still object that if, if, if our preferences and our commitments are based on false beliefs, that this intervention necessarily will change our preferences and commitments. And that's right. So for instance, if you think that we should expand bicycle lanes because bicycles have four wheels and are very wide, and then you undergo the veristic correction, then your preference for bicycle lane expansion will certainly change. This objection holds water, but it's, it's not quite problematic. And that's because it's unclear why we should prefer that our decisions be based on preferences informed by false beliefs. This is not really good dem democratically or societally. That would mean that democratic participants are reasoning on a reality completely different from their own. It's as if they have blindfolds on and are simply imagining a world completely different. This is really not very helpful. Rather, we should quite certainly prefer democratic decisions be made grounded in reality, grounded in what is actually going on. And so the, the Washington Post has this slogan that democracy dies in darkness. And here, the darkness is the blindfolds that I've just described. It's people holding false beliefs about the problems that they face, specifically, in this case, the risks that they face. And my solution is to shine light on it, is to take the blindfolds off, allow them to see that which is before them. And we can do this through veristic epistemic paternalism. By altering the way that we provide information, we can ensure that they achieve true beliefs. And this allows them to provide valid consent 
to policies which would otherwise harm them by violating that time. That's all I got. Uh, hello and thank you. My name is Ryan Balon and I'm currently on co-op with the Ethics Institute here at Northeastern doing a project on environmental ethics, more specifically wild animal ethics. So I want to motivate the problem first a little bit on why we should care about wild animal suffering. So it seems to be the case first and foremost that human harms are probably bad, such as cancer. It's probably good to eliminate something like that. Second off, it also seems to be true that we should care something about animals, period. Animal suffering is bad, or dog cancer is bad. And it also seems to be the case on top of that, that uh, there is a lot of suffering that occurs within the wild. Um, there's a lot of diseases, there's predation in which animals are gored apart incessantly, and there are a lot of uh, deaths right at the start of someone's life just based on uh, predation as well. So now that I'm motivated a bit, I want to move on to a case study to further elucidate this question. So we have two situations. Situation A, a child who you do not know is being eaten alive by a mountain lion. So out of this room, who here would say, if we could, we'd have some sort of obligation to save this kid? Probably. But now in situation B, we have a parallel example. The same exact thing with a white-tailed deer whom we also do not know. So out of the room here, who would say we have some sort of obligation to save the deer? <laughs> so yeah, it's a lot fu more fuzzy here. So this leads me to my research question, which is what, if anything, do we owe to, oh, uh-oh. There we go. What, if anything, do we owe to wild animals? Or to put it another way, what is the morally salient difference between these two situations, if there is one at all? So although this might seem like a pretty big pie in the sky philosophical idea without many implications, these two situations being morally equal has incredible implications for how we ought to deal with wild animal suffering. So first and foremost, um, it would allow for massive vaccination programs for wild animals, arguing that we have some sort of obligation to inoculate uh, wild animals to protect populations and individuals. Secondly, it would also imply that we would have to dewild certain areas in order to better manage individual wild animal welfare, in order to create more zoos and more reserves that care for individual welfare. It would also promote, in the long term, uh, genetic modification of our species, which lay thousands upon thousands of eggs, um, to K species, which only lay a few. The upside of this is that thousands of individuals will not be harmed um, by predation or just not getting enough food. And also, if these are morally equal, we'd also have some sort of obligation to end predation within nature, meaning that we would either have to be feeding wolves beyond meat or genetically modifying them to eat plants. So now I want to get into the few of the different views that uh, look to solve this problem and analyze these two situations. The first is the traditional environmentalists. The traditional environmentalists basically hold there's something intrinsically valuable about the property of wilderness, that humans not interfering in something gives something of value. So putting it in the terms of cases A and B, we should save the kid because it's a human kid, but with the deer, it has this property of wilderness that's just intrinsically valuable. I don't think this view is tenable for our purposes though. Um, one of the main problems of it is going to be the, sorry, it's going to be the definitional problem. So a lot of different animals exist in a lot of different relations with a lot of different humans, meaning that really trekking down and defining what wilderness truly means is going to be a really difficult project. And on top of that, uh, Bill McKibben theorized in the late 80s that because of anthropogenic climate change, Everything in the world at this point is somehow interfered with by humans. Because humans have put out so much CO2, it's affected every ecosystem in the world, meaning every individual, meaning 
This further complicates the definition of wild, since at this point, nothing is truly wild anymore because we've interfered with everything. And I think the last most salient uh, problem with this view is the human nature dichotomy problem, arguing that, uh, as Stephen Vogel argues in the book Thinking Like a Mall, humans build up cities and industrialize and such, just like beavers build up their dams in the rivers. They both cut down trees, they both alter the environments around them, and they both live in these areas. So the problem for the traditional environmentalists basically boils down to, why should we be valuing nature or the things that humans don't interfere with, but not nature or the things beavers don't interfere with? What is the special metaphysical difference between these two? And at this point, I don't think that difference exists or can be answered. Another traditional view is going to be the traditional animal egalitarians. These are your traditional utilitarians, uh, Tom Regan's rights-based view, and it's also going to be Martha Nussbaum's uh, capabilities approach. What these, at the heart of these views is that something is morally valuable when it has some sort of internal feature or some sort of ability to do things in the world. So notably in this case, between the kid and the deer, these would be equal cases because both the kid and the deer have equal capabilities and both have equal capability uh, to suffer, to um, exert their preferences, um, and pursue their own good. I also don't think this solution works well for answering my question of what we owe wild animals. First and foremost is going to be the problem of human inequality. Basically, a lot of humans exist such that there is a, if we take the capabilities or capacity approaches to be true, it would rank all humans based on their moral worth, based on their internal capacities. So it would mean some humans are genuinely worth more than others, and people with, that are severely and permanently cognitively disabled would be at the bottom of this rung because they just lack less capacities. Obviously, this is a very favorable view. Um, the second problem is going to be the question-begging problem, basically saying that any capacity-based approach in practice just relates back to how close is it to how humans act? So every intelligence test or capacity test that we give to chimps, elephants, and octopi, our logic puzzles are going to be mazes, are going to be IQ tests, things humans are already pretty good at. So the question is, why are we setting humans as this base standard rather than uh, individually um, assessing capabilities um, between individuals, if that's even possible? So a lot of these approaches in this way are pretty anthropocentric and thus unjustifiable. And the third problem with this view is the special relationships problem. If my dog gets into a fight with a local coyote or something like that, given this approach, I would have to flip a coin in order to decide whom to help. But under this view, it forgoes the uh, normal moral intuition that I should help my dog because it's my dog rather than giving aid to the coyote, who's just a random stranger. It forgoes a lot of uh, moral importance that I think is necessary to moral practice, and therefore another reason why I think the traditional egalitarian views are non-justifiable. So now I want to move on to sort of giving the positive project, uh, the view I'm starting to develop. And again, this entire presentation is very work in progress, so I'd welcome any criticism on any part of it. So Claire Palmer in 2010 wrote a pretty compelling book called Animal Ethics in Context, in which she develops the contextual approach to animal ethics, basically arguing that it's the relationships individuals have with each other that gives us this moral value. Basically, I, if I have a dog, I have more moral responsibility to that dog than to the random coyote, because again, it's my dog. I put them into this world, I care for them, and that is morally laden in some important way. And also, if I hit a deer with my car, for example, I owe something of justice to that deer because I hit that deer. So that other strangers or other deer would not have. That special relationship is created there. So not only is this non-speciesist, it doesn't create any arbitrary boundaries between humans and non-humans on the basis of species, but it has the added consequence of uh, allowing for a lot more ethical nuance that I claimed the normal animal egalitarian and capacity approaches lack. 
I believe, though, that this view um, has a few weaknesses, but I think those weaknesses can be repaired with slight additions. So right now, Claire Palmer's view as it stands is if you have these special relationships, that means you get moral worth. But I don't know if that's working because of a few problems which I'll mention. So first of all, it weakly accounts for our obligations to individuals who we have weak relationships with. For example, someone in rural Wyoming or someone in the middle of Zimbabwe, I don't have really strong relationships with. But by her methodology, it would also mean that I wouldn't owe anything in the way of positive assistance to them, which is a pretty unintuitive view and which would allow for, uh, which is a pretty unintuitive and un unattractive view in my, in my case. Um, and another big issue of it is that it uh, cannot account for our obligations to future generations precisely because future generations don't exist yet. So I can't have these relations with individuals that creates moral grounding just because these individuals don't exist. So it can't account for things in this way. So my project is going to be adding some general duties to uh, what we owe individuals. So basically there's going to be a moral standpoint where you ought not harm and you ought assist, if you can, individuals because they're individuals. And on top of that, I'm going to take a lot of Claire Palmer's uh, uh, back work, back, background work and add it on top of those basic duties. So I have some sort of general assistance to a deer, but I have more duties to the deer that I hit with my car because I hit them with my car. So in the end, going back to the case A and B with the kid and the deer, we probably owe something to both. Um, but our obligations to both, given that we don't have strong relations to either, is going to be relatively weak. Um, and again, these weak obligations are also pro tanto, meaning they can be outweighed by other considerations. So importantly, uh, a lot of epistemic challenges with helping wild animals and maintaining ecosystemic integrity can very easily be overriding concerns for aiding wild animals. Because when you help the deer, you hurt the grass, which hurts a bunch of other things with knock-on effects. So those are my conclusions, those are my research, and this is the project as it stands. I will look forward to any criticism, comments, or questions in the following Q&A session, and I thank you guys for your time. So Regina, it is our tradition to invite all of the speakers back up to, where's my speaker? Um, there she is, uh, back up and sort of flank the, the screen there. Yes. Um, so that we can ask questions from a very varied and vivid panel. Yes, Jacob. Gotcha. And Jacob, if you want to stand on that side of the screen, that would be great. Thank you so much to each of you for your presentations. I do, I'm do. i kind of like Laura, so I like to think kind of conceptually about the thread. But before getting to that, I, do wanted to, I did want to ask, um, what is next for each of you? Where do you see this research kind of living or expanding? Um, now that you have completed the project. And so why don't we go in reverse order? So why don't you start? Because I think you actually alluded to something here too. Um, my end goal is going to be publishing a paper in an undergraduate journal. Excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so my research has been going on since, I guess pretty seriously since last July, but informally since last spring. Um, and so right now it's uh, developed into my senior thesis, which is rapidly approaching its deadline. So oh. soon it just will be done. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm hoping to um, publish parts of it. Uh, and yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am a black feminist studies minor, so I really just hope to continue in the field in general, but to focus in on black lesbian feminist practice. Um, I'm fingers crossed doing another independent study this summer on women marriage and same-sex relationships in indigenous Africa. Um, so transferring that to, transferring the knowledge I gained from this one to a more anthropological um, and indigenous perspective. And just to follow up, Jadia, what will happen to the blog? I will continue blogging. Okay. <laughs> yes. um, it's just my name, www.geniabrown.com, so all of my blog posts are up there. Um, and uh, I will be posting either random blogs or once this research kicks off, um, information on that. Thank you. Do we want to, I'll open it up and let someone else ask a question. <laughs> Why don't we start with you? Thank you. 
Um, Jacob, I thought your presentation was interesting, and I noticed a like interesting distinction in your language where you would say, like, oh, we should provide this information to them in this way, and a sort of uh, separating yourself from being the person receiving the potentially altered information. So I was interested in your uh, opinion on like who would be the person determining uh, how information is, is uh, conveyed to the general public. Yeah, so this is primarily a responsibility. I, I, I'm just going to throw my hands up and primarily say this is for the cognitive psychologist to figure out what mm -hmm. the most efficient way is to provide information that ensures true beliefs. Um, because that's a big challenge. I mean, we would need to counteract these sorts of biases, errors, and, and heuristics extremely precisely. We would need to hit the, the true belief target like exactly. And we'd need to do that for each, each participant. So in some way, I don't know. Um, but the people who would be <coughs> providing that information would be the public officials, would be the technocrats, which of course invites a number of questions about trust. Um, but uh, yes, that is your question. I want to make sure I understood it. OK. Let's see. I saw you second, and then Laura goes last. <laughs> Jimmy, hi. Hi. Um, I love your presentation. I have a question about the um, materiality of these kind of anthologies. And if you think, especially since you kept a blog, um, if you think that the um, medium is uh, important for the analysis of the resistive character of this um, writing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. sure. I think that medium is definitely important, even just for reaching different audiences. Uh, for example, um, as a black feminist, obviously I'm very interested in these pieces, um, but somebody who isn't in a black feminist practice um, might receive this information differently. Um, I think that film and art can also be very resistive in the way that they defy their own practices um, and the way that black lesbian art goes against general artistic practices, um, which we see a lot. Um, for example, Alexis Pauline Gums, this collages of um, famous black feminists um, and the way that those are constructed differs from the way that a collage would be constructed by a different, um, even a different black feminist, um, regardless of identity. So I think that medium is important in terms of who you're reaching, um, but I personally believe that the existence of black lesbians and the visibility of black lesbians itself will always have that resistive nature. Um, and you can use a medium to turn it into an intentional resistance, which we see in more political pieces. Laura, do you have a question that's for all three panelists, or do you have one that is specifically for our third panelist, Ryan, who has not yet had a question I asked about? I do actually have a I have both. Okay. Um, but Ryan was one of the people that yeah. I actually had just a very specific Perfect. question for, which is, it seems to me, I mean, you sort of address this, so in your um, proposed solution that draws on Claire, uh, yeah. Um, I thought you were addressing this when you said it weekly accounts for tragedy in human cases, but my problem was, I mean, you say it's non-speciesist, right? And that's a strength. But isn't the implication then that in the dear child, um, if we change the dear slash child uh, example a little bit to mm -hmm. say it's either the child of someone I don't know who's being eaten by the mountain lion um, or my dog that's being eaten by the mm -hmm. mountain lion. It seems to me that this view, the relational view, would suggest that because I have a stronger tie to my dog, I have a greater duty to interfere in the case of the dog. That And that may be fine with you. I think that for a lot of people, that would violate a moral intuition. Mm -hmm. Like, that says, we have to value, especially given that they're both like innocent, like that's the point of the child, right? I mean, yeah. it's not like Ronald Reagan who's in the, in the mouth of the dog. Um, that we have to value <laughs> the life of an innocent human creature before the, above the life of a non-human animal, even if we have like a stronger affective tie to that animal. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering how, what you do with do you think that moral intuition is just wrong? Or, and are you prepared to like, say yeah. so? 
Um, if it is the case that aren't, there aren't any uh, relational ties, not just effective ties, but like contractual, um, no political, economic, like all these other ties, then I think it would be the case that you should save your dog. That's a strong position. <laughs> okay. I mean, in some ways, my question wasn't, is that the case? Because obviously it, it yeah. does. But like whether you feel that you're willing to incorporate yeah. that into your argument. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And do I get it? Yes, please. Because then in some ways that leads mm -hmm. to my, and I know, Regine, you probably want to do this too, but because as you said, we both like to, to kind of do the synthesis. And I will say this was the panel. So the past, the previous two panels, I thought, the paper, there was a through line that I could find. Mm. This panel, I was thinking, mm, not finding it. These papers all seem so interesting and somewhat disparate. And then someone, it was either Jacob or um, Ryan said the word standpoint. Mm. And then I had my little through line because it mm. seems to me that the through line, which is a contradiction line, is that they all have some relationship to what used to be called standpoint theory mm -hmm. in feminist um, practice in the set, but different ones. So right. for like Jania's um, paper, um, and of course, Patricia Hill Collins is a, is a black feminist theorist, so that's nice. Um, but your, your project really is sort of all about standpoint. I mean, it mm -hmm. is your, it is a fundamental assumption for you that, that where you stand, who you are, how you are embodied in the so. world, matters not only to you, but to other people, because it makes mm -hmm. you resistive or not, mm -hmm. which in another world I would have a ton of questions about. <laughs> Whereas Jacob's paper, which is fascinating, seems to me um, to exist in a universe, uh, and I'm familiar with this universe, but a sort of maybe a Habermasian or Platonic universe where there really is no, there's no question of standpoint um, there, although, Laura, you were sort of alluding to this, um, but you're not, for example, in your analysis concerned with, I mean, you alluded to issues of trust, but you're not concerned with, well, who, who's determining the verity or mm -hmm. who is determining, like, what counts as truth and what the boundaries are or around to how we can manipulate it and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and these are, of course, partly, although not entirely disciplinary um, uh, differences. And then, Ryan, in your paper it's also it's trying to do it's different from both i mean it's trying to do something with standpoint and i think it's trying to find ways of valuing it or thinking about it that don't fall along the traditional lines of say species right um and that aren't even about like it's interesting we're not really interested in the child's point of view or the deer's point of view. We're interested, it's, it's mm -hmm. the standpoint of the, the intervener. So yeah. that was the through line that I finally found. And I just wondered if anyone, any of the presenters um, wanted to respond to, the, to this question of sort of standpoint or point of view, or however in your discipline you, you, know, you denominate that, that question of who is standing and speaking and making the does that make sense? I, I think it's interesting from a black feminist perspective because obviously black feminism does center the experiences of black women um, in a way that most practices do not. But like the Combahee River Collective quote states, black feminism is not only for black women. Um, it's not even only for women or for black people. To understand black feminism is to seek a way for liberation for all. Um, and it's inherently connected to other feminisms, to other liberation movements and can be a basis for understanding what does that true liberation mean for people who are truly at the intersection of a lot of different oppressive structures. Um, so for me, black feminism is about everybody's standpoint, everybody's point of view, and how does that come together to understand how we are being affected by oppressive systems as individuals, but also as communities. Um, so as important as the community and the collectivity is, another reason I decided to choose anthologies is that I got tens of different perspectives right. from individual authors and that individual experience is as important as the community experience. Thank you. Ryan, did you have a... Um, I think the, uh, the moral view I try to motivate at the end does sort of rely on a similar intuition where it's 
heavily uh, based on community, based on individual relations one has with others, rather than some, uh, rather than a strict, always holding, like utilitarianism mm -hmm. root calculus, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is one of the virtues of it, but I don't know how strongly it would relate. That's a, that's a nice question. I mean, yeah. yours, of course, in some ways, it's your project that I really have in my sights. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't worry. I, I, I just want to make sure I understand it correctly first, yeah. but I think that I was just discussing this, so I have some ideas. Um, so the concern is that we're, or rather it's the question of, how do we know that the technocrats are getting it right? How do we know that their version That's of the true. truth is the one that positive? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. So um, this is a good objection. And for the most part, it's been kind of hemmed away from my thesis for time constraints, because um, it is a bit of a can of worms, and I deal with a number of others. But this is pretty popular. Um, there is a nice debate in the philosophy of risk between um, Cass Sunstein and Sheila Jasanoff about this very idea in regards to societal risk preferences and how we should regulate. And so Sheila Jasanoff takes a much more socially based view, which is that you know um, people should be really, really involved in making regulatory decisions regarding appropriate risk thresholds. Um, and uh, in some ways, I'm all for that. I mean, that's sort of the whole point of this um, direct democracy or constitutive democracy is that the people in some ways should have a say about the risks that they find appropriate for their life. Um, but I do have a belief that uh, I think Sunstein shares, which is that there's some sort of objective truth to the essential probabilistic nature of risk, and that there's some sort of part of risk that it just is, and that can be standardized in a way that is non-controversial. Mm. Um, and so maybe it's better when we talk about true beliefs to focus just on probabilities, because I think we're more comfortable saying numbers are true, and there's no real debate about it. Um, but that might not get the whole story. But I, I think that's one, that's one move that we can make. Yeah. Well, we are really out of time. So thank you so much for your presentations. And good luck with all your endeavors. And thank you so much for organizing us to everyone that organized. And I look forward to attending this again next year. Thank you all. <laughs> So particularly to Jen for managing for three hours our um, our technology. So thank you, Jen. You're welcome.